much. Okay, thank you everyone. I declare open this hearing of the COVID-19 Select Committee. Today's public hearing will focus on the impacts of COVID-19 on the repatriation and international travel, but may cover other matters under the terms of reference. As set out in the program, the committee will hear evidence today, um, this morning, from individuals impacted by repatriation and international travel, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Department of Home Affairs, including Australian Border Force, Department of Health and the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications. Information on the procedural rules governing public hearings have been provided to witnesses and is available from the Secretariat. Witnesses should speak clearly and into their microphones to assist Hansard to record proceedings. Senators and witnesses who are appearing via video conference are reminded to mute their microphones when they're not speaking. Witnesses appearing via teleconference should state their name prior to speaking. Mobile phones should be switched off um, or turned to silent. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind senators and witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, witnesses are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to the committee, and any such action may be treated by the senator's contempt. It may also be contempt to give false or misleading evidence to the committee. Some of the committee's witnesses are appearing this morning from overseas, and I remind senators and witnesses that parliamentary privilege does not apply to countries or persons outside of Australia. Now, I welcome um, this morning for as our first witnesses, Mr. David Jeffries, Ms. Ms. Kate Jeffries, Ms. Fiona Wright, and Carly, who um, would like not to have her surname uh, made public. Uh, we are just trying to patch in um, Fiona Wright, who's had some video or sound problems. Um, so just, I think if we, start with the people who we do have audio and sound from uh, and then hopefully Fiona will be able to join us. But before I hand to other senators, perhaps if um, if the Jeffreys family, I can see we've also got a, a little Jeffrey there as well. Uh, Mitchell. Uh, welcome Mitchell. And Carly, if you'd like to perhaps just update the committee on your situation before we hand uh, to other senators for questions. Perhaps if I start with the Jeffries and then I'll go to you, Carly. Very good, thank you. And I'd like to start by thanking the committee for giving us this opportunity to be heard. Um, and a specifically a thank you to Senator Keneally for her ongoing vocal support to bring stand stranded Australians home. Very much appreciated. My name is David. This is my wife Kate and our son Mitchell, who will be joining us for as long as his attention span holds out. <laughs> we flew to Canada on February 26th to care for my mother, who had recently been diagnosed with cancer. We had return flights booked for March 29th, which were cancelled on March 20th. We have been trying to get home ever since, and like many stranded Australians, we had our travel plans disrupted many times. Um, this forced separation from our home has had a significant impact on our finances, our domestic arrangements, and even our health. Living with the constant uncertainty of not knowing how or when we may be able to return home is exhausting. We feel betrayed and abandoned by the current policies of the Australian government, which have had the combined effect of denying over 36,000 Australians to be able to return home, while sporting teams and most skilled labour are fast-tracked into the country. Being stranded is expensive, and the Australian bills haven't stopped just because we're not home. We're still paying a mortgage, rates, utilities, and all our normal expenses in Australia. But those costs are now being mirrored in Canada with housing, health, utilities, and vehicle costs here. To make it worse, because of and a direct result of per person caps of 35 to 41 passengers per plane arriving in Perth, you will likely need to upgrade to business class tickets, which range anywhere from 9,000 to our seen as high as $17,000 each to get us home. After the $5,000 bill from the Australian government for quarantine, we expect to have paid an absolute minimum, at least $25,000 just in travel expenses to get home. We estimate the direct additional cost of this whole energy to be well over 50,000 to my family, money which we would have much rather put towards Mitchell's education. As mentioned previously, we live in a state of constant uncertainty. We are Schrodinger's travellers, if you will. We are simultaneously always leaving and never leaving. 
We've had flights canceled within 24 hours of departure, which has thrown our domestic rain heat into chaos on multiple occasions. We are not residents of this country. We have limited access to medical services, no financial assistance, and both Kate and Mitchell's visas expired months ago. Kate is supposed to return to work in February, and she will lose her job if we're not able to return in time. Kate is also in her third year of architecture at her university, but has had to give that up because we never knew where we were going to be in a month's time. Our Australian private health cover doesn't cover us here. So we've had to get expensive travel health insurance to cover injury and accidents, but that doesn't cover non-urgent issues. So Mitchell hasn't been able to get his regular uh, health mental checks. We've had to withdraw him from an important vaccine trial run by the Children's Hospital in Perth. And we were several months late in getting him to vaccines. In addition, uh, Kate has medical issues um, that require ongoing monitoring and treatment, which we have to stay on top of. This constant uncertainty for such an extended period has taken its toll on our mental health. We've grown increasingly angry and frustrated at the Australian government's unwillingness to implement safe alternatives that would allow us to return home. The narrative of fear and otherism being promulgated by voices within the government has stigmatized very Australians in the eyes of our countrymen. Social media is filled with comments from Australians telling us to stay away that it's your fault you're stuck. You should have come home already. But my personal favorite, that they hope you catch cold and die. Traveling with a young child increases the impacts of transit delays, the best of times, and especially during its pandemic. Many borders are closed, including the Canada-US border. Once we leave Canada, we will not be able to return if something goes wrong in transit. If we got bumped off a connecting flight in the US, we wouldn't be allowed in Canada, we wouldn't be allowed back into the US, and we wouldn't be able to get into Australia. To our knowledge, the last direct flight from Canada to Australia was April 11th. We've heard the stories of airlines preying on the desperate Australians trying to get a seat home, taking money for flights that they know won't fly, and then taking months to process refunds if in fact they're getting refunds at all, rather than useless flight credits. Flights to Australia are regularly overbooked with excessive flight caps. At last count, there were 132 passengers booked on our Qatar to Perth flight on December 19th, and we are fully expecting to be notified that we won't be on it once again. International borders destroyed. State border closures, including the border into Western Australia, means that choosing to fly into the East Coast means accepting the risk of being re-stranded or facing a second quarantine on a route to WA. The recent lockdown of states of Australia, the abrupt closure of its borders in some ports on international flights is a testament to how risky it is for us trying to get back to them. The Prime Minister of Australia stood in front of the cameras on November 13th and said, there is a queue and Australians are in the front of that queue. The day prior, the entire Indian cricket team and their families arrived in Sydney. As parents, we hope to raise our son to have more respect for the truth than the Prime Minister of Australia. The reality is there is no queue that my family and I can join to reserve our spot in hotel quarantine. And if there is a queue we don't know about, we certainly aren't in front of it. Race horses, tennis and cricket players, unskilled labor are given being to the priority over Australians trying to return home. According to ABS statistics, over 31,000 non-citizen, non-permanent visa holders have arrived in Australia in the last six months, making up over a quarter of all arrivals. This, while so many of us are remain unable to secure a seat home. That same ABS data projects that under the current arrangements, it will take quite seven years to repatriate the 36,000 Australians that are stuck overseas. We just want what every parent in our situation would want, to be able to get ourselves and our family home safely. We demand the government finds the political will and practical means to allow us to do so. Find scientifically sound ways to increase quarantine throughput. Coordinate with airlines to bring us home at a reasonable cost. Provide safe corridors for, for families in need. We need a national risk-based approach to home quarantine with appropriate levels of monitoring, testing, and penalties for non-compliance. 
Australia remains the only country in the world whose policies, still in place by Matsami, are having the effect of denying their citizens the right to return to the country. And that is about as un-Australian as it gets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you. Dave. Um, Kate, did you want to add anything in there? Um, just. Uh, not really at this time. Yeah. I'm happy to wait if someone else go and wait for questions. Can, um, on behalf of the committee, I thank you very much for um, taking us through that. It's obviously and clearly been an extremely difficult uh, year for you, and uh, I'm hoping very much, I'm sure all of us are, that uh, we see you back in Australia as soon as possible, and hopefully that some of the questions we have for agencies uh, later in the morning um, might assist with some more information for you. Can I go now to um, Carly, and then I, it does appear that we've got Fiona with us. Um, certainly we can see you, Fiona. Hopefully we can hear you as well. Carly, would you like to quick, uh, briefly update the committee on your situation? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your time as well today, and my heart goes out to the Jeffries family. Um, I personally am representing the campaign Fly the Babies Home. So I gave birth to my baby in lockdown in April. Um, obviously, that was a very tough time to have my first baby. And my mother was meant to fly over for the end of my pregnancy and to support me with my newborn. And as time passed and the days and the weeks went on, she obviously had to cancel her flight because the borders shut. So she wasn't able to come out for the birth and to support me for the first couple of weeks. Um, and we always thought that Ailish would be a month old or two months old or three months old. And as the time went on, there was there was just no increase in her in the caps in her being able to come over to me and me to be able to fly to her. Um, it was a really testing time because we were in lockdown and, you know, not being able to have your your birth partner um, at the um, at the birth. And then afterwards, not being able to have any support. A lot of the mums didn't have NCT groups or mothers groups because they're all cancelled. You've got no family over there. So we literally, you know, had nobody. And there was just kind of no light at the end of the tunnel for, for me can to I be able to go to a... Kylie, can, it might help um, just for those who are watching to understand. You were, you were in the UK when you gave birth. Is that right? Yes, correct. Right. Yeah. So when you talk about your mother coming, it's her coming from Australia? Yeah, from Australia. Right. And yeah. so this period you're describing is you in the UK. Um, yes, okay. I think that would just Correct. be helpful for people to understand. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> We're with you now, uh, Carly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the, the week sort of went on and it was just getting really upsetting for me um, to have all of my flights and my husband's family's flights being cancelled and not being able to get out to the UK. And I just thought to myself, you know, there has to be other people in my position. There has to be other Australian lockdown mums that are literally locked down in, in Australia, uh, sorry, in the UK without any, any support from anybody. And I actually then started the Fly the Babies Home campaign. So the campaign began um, realistically to be able to get safe passage over to Australia with our babies. And this means bums on seats and being able to have a decent place to quarantine when we actually turned up to, um, to Australia to have some kind of um, apartment with a kitchenette to help, you know, sterilise bottles, make food for the babies um, and opening windows or fresh air or even a balcony. And that's kind of where the campaign started. Um, I launched it not really thinking much of it and then was completely overwhelmed with the response of hundreds of hundreds of Australians that were trapped in the UK who couldn't have anybody come to visit them and they physically couldn't get back to their home country. Um, these mums are strong um, resilient mothers. Um, having a baby in lockdown is one of the worst times you can have a baby. Like I say, birth partners weren't there. You're constantly out and about wearing a mask. Your baby's afraid of the mask. You're going for injections. You can't cuddle your baby because you've got to anti-back your hands and there you, you've got a mask on. You can't kiss and cut. You know, it's a really tough journey and to not be able to have the support is really, really difficult. Um, so I basically got to a point where I'd had over 350 families registered. Some of these were like the Jeffries family where they literally couldn't get back. A lot of the mothers were planning on having their babies and moving home. They had jobs lined up. 
they had packed up their houses, they were ready to ship everything or everything had gone. And then they were then moving with their babies from Airbnb to Airbnb. They'd given up, obviously the mum was on that leave, the dad had given up their job and it was just constant turning up to the airport even and getting bumped off flights consistently with a baby. Um, or they were having to go and book additional airfares for anywhere between ten and $20,000 to be able to get home. So I had a lot of different people that were registered for the campaign, but all in the same situation. They just wanted to get home. They just wanted to get to their home country and they couldn't. And like David was saying before, you know, being locked out of your country, you, you, you've been abandoned and it, you, there's, there's, it's indescribable to know that you can't get home. And it's also indescribable when you've had a baby and your family aren't going to meet your baby until they're, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 months old. Um, so I started the campaign. I sent hundreds of emails um, to the government. A lot of the people that were registered for the campaign sent a lot of emails um, to Parliament officials, Scott Morrison, Marissa Payne, Peter Dutton, Health Minister. And I did my best. I actually found um, an airline that were willing to partner with us, an airline that were willing to fly the babies home. Um, they were ready. We worked out all of the logistics. I'd had all of the meetings. I didn't sort of said to the government, look, we can all come on the same plane. We can come in batches of sort of 20 families, if that helps you. I didn't get a single response, not one single response, apart from the lovely Penny Wong, who was really, really supportive. And I just thought, hang on a minute, how have I got a seven month old baby? I'm a first time mum, I've got no support. I've been working with all of these other mothers on a daily basis, hearing their stories, setting up WhatsApp support groups so that everyone you know, feels like they've got some support overseas because we can't get home. And I didn't even get one single email to say, I've received your, your email. And I was sending them, people registered for the campaign were um, families of people registered and it was just falling on deaf ears. And so come November 1, I kind of had to make the call that you know, I've tried my absolute hardest and it's it's just heartbreaking for me because I, I can't get home. I can't get these people home. And I've I feel that I've done everything in my power humanly possible to try and get involved and make a change and, and nothing happened. So the situation that you know I've got at the moment is some um, mums are making it back. There's four sort of really helpful travel agents that are getting people out of the UK, but we're literally pack your bags and in 24 hours you can go and it's going to cost you X amount. So I'm extremely fortunate that I landed back in Australia um, two days ago. I'm currently in quarantine at the moment. But those flights cost us over 11,000 Australian dollars for two adults. And then we're paying, obviously, quarantine on top of that. I've got another mother who's flying out in two weeks who's paid $28,000 for two adults and an infant to come back to Australia. I've had another mother whose flights were cancelled. Um, so they paid originally back in sort of July or something, the normal price, around a, a thousand, one and a half thousand, and then their airline cancelled, but then made them pay the price difference of about another six or seven grand to get home. So the prices, you know, again, like the, to the Jeffries family point, I how we're, we're paying this money, but it's just going on credit cards or it's savings that we were having for our babies for education. And we're now having to fork out between 20, 20 and $30,000 to get home. Um, it's also causing a lot of anxiety um, to these mothers around where they're going to be quarantined. The stress that comes with that, because you have no idea where you're turning up. You don't know if you've got a kitchenette, you don't know if you've got a cot, you've got a high chair, all these things that you need for a, by now, six or seven month old baby. Um, and again, horrendous stories. Can I have some puree? They're delivering curry puffs for a seven month old or they're delivering chips or a piece of bread. Um, it, you've got, you know, you're turning up to these hotel rooms. There's a mother I've got at the moment who has paid an extortionate amount. She's been bumped off several flights. She's finally in quarantine in four walls, a standard room, no fresh air. They couldn't deliver a cot. They couldn't deliver a high chair. She flew into somewhere where they didn't have, um, they, because of the caps, they've flown in outside of where they live. So it's great that you can have care packages, but when you've got the caps, you just have to take the seats to where they're going. So she's now sitting there. She can't even get anything delivered by her family because she has to get on another flight to go and see her family. Um, another lady was allowed 15 minutes of fresh air time from her hotel room. That was in the smoking area. So she had to take her eight-month-old down to the smoking area for 15 minutes a day so he could crawl around. And I've got pictures of him covered 
ash in smoke ash on his hands and his knees because that's the only place that he was able to crawl so these and i've got so many of these stories that i'm more than happy to share so yeah. not only have yeah. you got the anxiety of these mothers that are paying extortionate amounts to be bumped off several flights to then get home to then land somewhere where they're literally in four walls I've got, you know, you're having to sterilise bottles in a kettle because there's there's no other way to sterilise your baby's items. Um, and, you know, for us speaking on behalf of all of them, even if something could be done, we understand at the at-home quarantine, which is what I was fighting for firstly, is, is way off. You know, unfortunately it is. It's upsetting because, you know, like I say, you're seeing cricket teams and celebrities and everyone fly in and they seem to be able to be doing some kind of private quarantine. I understand it's pumping money into the economy. They're paying an extortionate amount. But why, sh why just because they have money, should they be able to get that right yeah. and not us? Yeah. Um, so even if there was some kind of guarantee for families, to, to just to take away that additional anxiety that everyone's already going through, to be able to say, OK, when you land, we can't tell you where because your thousands of relatives will probably turn up outside the hotel. But we can at least guarantee that you will have a window that opens or a balcony and you will have a small kitchenette where you'll be able to look after your baby safely mm. and for me you know if that added anxiety can just be taken away um it would be amazing for for all of the families and of course the number one thing lifting the caps um again i've had a lot of hate running this campaign i've had a lot of media coverage over um in australia which has been amazing but that follows with that's why i'm disclosing my last name people will be able to yeah. find it but yeah um you know, you should have stayed where you are. Your baby isn't even Australian. You chose to have a baby overseas. You should stay where you are. Um, you're a princess. You're privileged. Um, oh, I'd like about thanks. All of these messages. It's like, yeah, I did choose to have a baby overseas. But me and all of the other mothers, we had probably seven or eight months of support because we had all of our family flying over. They can't leave. We can't get to them. We didn't know this was going to happen to us. Um, and I think another point to raise is, you know, why are grandparents not classified as, as immediate family? Because, OK, we can't fly over to Australia, but grandparents should be able to come over to the UK so we can at least get support that way. Um, but again, they're not classified as immediate family. Every exemption that I've ever heard of has not been approved. I have no idea how that runs. Um, and, you know, there is the offer of DFAT flights. But if I can be completely honest, it's... Um, a little bit of a shambles <laughs> um, over there in terms of the repatriation flights. It's a whole another world of anxiety that it, it causes for people all racing to get tickets when that email comes to your inbox at 30 in the morning. Yeah. Um, sorry, that's <laughs> a lot to say. But that's um, kind of the yeah the gist of the campaign and kind of who I'm representing and the situation that I've that a lot of the mothers and families are currently in at the moment after an already kind of an anxious time having a baby in the situation that we had to have a baby in and not be able to have your family meet your baby. You know, eight months of Alicia's life has been taken from me because I couldn't get home. And my mum finally met her yesterday when she basically climbed up to a rooftop car park to wave at us off of a balcony. I never thought, you know, I'm very happy that I'm finally on Australian soil. But for my mum to meet her first grandchild like that is... Mm. It, it's unexplainable and I can't get that time back you know Scott Morrison cannot give me or any of the other families that time back we will never see her with a newborn ever she's seeing her for the first time when she's eight months old and um, yeah very upsetting Carly can I um thank you for um giving us that evidence this morning and anyone who's traveled with an infant or been through those first months of um new being a new parent um we can't even imagine what this year has been like for you and the fact that you've gone on and kind of advocated on behalf of hundreds of families on top of all of that is is amazing. Um, so thank you very much, really, for everything that you're doing. It's it's just such an important message that we get out and, and that people listen to. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll go to Fiona now and then hopefully we'll have a time for a quick few questions for people um, in this session. So Fiona, can you tell us how you're going uh, since we last saw you Hello. and um, yeah, update us on your situation? You can hear me? We can. Oh, good. Um, I'm now in quarantine in Darwin. I arrived two days ago. Um, so... Uh, Fiona, Dave you were you were in India too, weren't you? Last time we we spoke, you appeared from India. 
I, I appeared from India, yes. So um, since we last spoke, many things. Dave covered a lot, Carly covered a lot. So many um, flights cancelled, <coughs> sorry. Um, and the repatriation flights, I came in on one. My repatriation flight had 170 people on it, sitting next to each other. And yet the um, commercial airlines can only have 30 or 40. How does that work? You know, if it's not safe for them, why is it safe for me? And yet Qantas very clearly said, oh, we've got super filters on our plane. You're very safe. You're feeling, even though you're sitting next to somebody, it's the same as being seven feet away from them because we've got such good filters. So why have we been through all this trauma of only allowed to have 40 people on a flight and getting bumped and bumped and bumped? And, and yet now Qantas magically can... Um, Pack us in like sardines. I find that very interesting. Um, I so I finally my sixth flight was going to be on Qantas two weeks ago. I got to Delhi. I got the COVID test and I tested positive two weeks ago. Um, yeah, lovely. Absolutely no symptoms. I don't feel ill. I didn't feel ill. I had no. Um, no thought in the back of my mind, even if I was pretending I was well in front of people, I had no thought that I was sick or a, you know, a risk to anybody or anything like that. So I've just been practicing quarantine for two weeks in Delhi, which was really exciting in a hotel room there. They have the worst pollution in the world. So if you're not sick before you get there, you've got a good chance of, you know. Um, and then I tested negative twice, got on the plane, came here, came into the quarantine here. The staff are wonderful. They're really trying to make people comfortable and feel safe and stuff. But you only find that out when you actually bump into them throughout the system. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what it's like. I understand mm. what you're saying, Carly. It's really, really scary. Where am I going to be? I, I got that experience in Delhi when I tested positive because uh, nobody kind of knew what the system was going to be. Um, so, so I'm here now. Ah, I just tested positive again yesterday, oh, which wow. is bizarre. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, I'm here and the staff were like, oh, well, you'll be fine. You've got 14 days in front of you. It'll be fine. It's probably a residue of, um, from before, but we're at risk. You know, we're, we're Australian citizens and stuff over there, you know, wherever you are, you're, you're at constant risk of um, being, being infected. I, I've certainly done everything. We've been nowhere since lockdown started in March. We are in our home or we're in our workshop and a very small group of people and we only go in a little circle. So we've tried to be really, really careful. Mm. Um, so that's my sort of update. And Fiona, you're, are you in, you're in Darwin at the moment, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, you're, how are you feeling? Are you feeling better? Or fine. yeah, okay. I'm not. I haven't been sick at anywhere anywhere along the whole thing. I had no. When I got the first positive result in Delhi two two and a half weeks ago, I was like, "How can that be? You must have made a mistake." Please check because I'm not sick. I, I don't have a headache, a fever, a cough. Nothing, nothing to indicate. And we do temperature checks every day at home at work because we have a workshop. We do temperature checks every day in India. So yeah. when all this started, my husband was moving to Australia to live here half the year and, and still maintain our um, family contacts in, De in India the rest of the time. So yeah. I was relocated. Now I've left him there because his mother's ill, you know, an older yeah. lady. I'm, I'm the grandmother. So, yes, I think I'm an immediate family member and I need to be with my our, our children here and our grandchildren here. Mm. So I'm well, relocating. Yeah. With that. Well, we do really appreciate you coming back to appear today, uh, Fiona. We're pleased to see you back on Australian soil after such a, a amazing 2020 for you. Um, can I go to... I'm really happy that you're continuing to do this because nobody listens. Like Carly said, there's yeah. so much hate out there. Yeah. I got a really charming letter from the Prime Minister months after my first letters started going 
And it was basically berating me like a naughty child for being late coming home. That was in the official letter from the Prime Minister just a, just a week or two ago. Really rude. Mm. Um, you know? Chair, yeah, um, I'm wondering if we could get a copy of that letter. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, sure. Fiona, if you I'll could send, send that through, that would be excellent. Can I um, hand it? I'll but hand yes. to Chris, uh, Senator Keneally um, and do hopefully a quick whip around of senators if we've got time. Uh, I want to thank you, Fiona. I want to thank Kylie. I want to thank Dave and Katie. I'm sorry. Um, Dave and Katie, your story was so moving. And I'm so sorry that you have been unable to come back, that you've been in this situation, and that you've had such negative comments from some of your fellow Australians. I hope that you do get to come back to Australia soon, and I hope that this hearing helps provide a greater awareness amongst the Australian community as to the kinds of circumstances our Australian, our fellow Australians are finding themselves in overseas. I just wanted to ask you, have you had any information or assistance provided by the Australian High Commission uh, while you've been in Canada? And when was the last time you were contacted by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade? Uh, so, we pretty much, um, after we got our flights cancelled uh, and the folks were closed, we referred to the Smart Traveller website just to get a bit of advice. And we saw on there that even though um, the Prime Minister had asked people to return home, even though that wasn't possible for us because our flight was cancelled, uh, the advice from Smart Traveller was to, if you can maintain employment, just to stay in place and we decided that was a good option for us because we were not sure how things were to unfold. And as it became increasingly clear that we were not going to get home, uh, we had our um, Air Canada said they were not going to fly until June and then that got pushed back till September. We then contacted the Australian High Commission in Canada to see what routes were safest for us to get home, especially in Mitchell. Uh, they advised us it's probably best to go through the US or Hong Kong. And at that point in the US, there was the Black Lives Matter protests um, at a very high COVID rate. Hong Kong also had political protests going on, and then they, they actually cancelled all transit through Hong Kong. Um, we went back to Smart Traveller. We were advised not to go through Hong Kong, so that was no longer an option for us. Uh, and after that, uh, especially with Western Australia's border closures, we determined that the only way that we were going to be able to come home was through Doha. Um, those flights have been now cancelled twice, and we're now rebooked on the 18th of December, and we're quite confident that will also be cancelled because there's, I think, 100, 132 booked on that flight with a cap of between 35 and 45. So, um, yeah, we're expecting that will also be cancelled. We've registered with DFAT as well. We did that back in August. Uh, and DFAT rang us probably 10 days ago now to ask us a series of questions um, whether or not we were still hoping to come home, uh, if we were just going to be visiting Australia, um, and whether or not we do, <laughs> whether or not we wish to return uh, by Christmas, which obviously we replied we wanted to come home. As soon as possible, we've been trying to get home since um, March. So, yeah, that's been all our contact with DFAT and the Commission here. Sorry, Kate, can I just ask a quick question there? Did you just say you were asked, um, you said you were asked whether you were just coming to visit, but whether you wanted to come home by Christmas? Is that what you said? Yeah, so when we advised them that we were um, returning home, we were not going to be visiting Australia, we were then asked whether it, uh, we were hoping to be home by Christmas. Yes, I, I had the same call. I got the description we were trying to talk about it. Yeah. We were trying to. Yeah. They, they asked several times in several different ways, are we sure we wanted to get home? To which I responded, yes, and include as many information points as your online form allows behind your face. Mm, okay. 
Okay. Um, parent, uh, Senator Davey, do you have a, some questions? Uh, thank you. Just a, um, a couple of just really brief questions. Um, Harley, just to you, um, and thank you all for appearing and giving your time today. Um, I, I should have opened with that. Um, Carly, just to you, I just want to understand, you said that you'd had conversations with an airline and you actually had the agreement of an airline to bring home a group of people through your Fly the Babies Home campaign. Uh, and you said you'd written to um, politicians. Did you also contact the embassy and have discussions with, um, with uh, embassy officials as well about how that um, plan could work? So um, the airline, which you know, I can let you know um, offline, but they want to kind of yeah. keep this confidential. That's fine. Well. They did have private conversations with the commission themselves. So they and what we have what happened at first, the first sort of couple of weeks, they were having those conversations, and then I said, look, you know, would it help if I also started to contact, um, you know, politicians within Australia? And we got to the point where we were like, well. Then anything's going to help really um, and then at that point that's when then myself other people that were registered and their families then um, submitted letters to the government um, basically outlining a, a logistics plan um, and requesting some kind of um, apartment quarantine. So um, was the original plan uh, just to fly everyone to a single location and then hopefully have a have a uh, sort of a wholesale quarantine set up at a single yeah. So um, ideally it would have gone into each state, but then as the campaign progressed, I realised how strict and different every single state was. So we just agreed that we would fly into Sydney. Um, so we just then could focus on the caps being lifted in that one place and we could focus on the accommodation being in that one place. And then everybody that was on that plane would then after their quarantine be able to then um, fly into their other states where they were from. Um, and if the, the proposal didn't progress, your understanding is because you couldn't get the support um, for, do you, have you had feedback as to where the blockage was? Was it with state caps or quarantine capacity um, in the state level or was it that uh, the, the um, overall proposal was just not going to fly apart with the pun? <laughs> yeah. um, so I think the main issue for me was I had nothing. I did not receive one single response apart from um, from Senator Penny Wong saying, you know, we are in support of, you know, lifting the caps and we're meeting on a regular basis. I had a couple of local MPs. But other than that, the people that I actually needed to get answers from, I also left several um, voicemails with the Foreign Affairs Office. Um, Peter Dutton asked for them to have a call with me. Um, Marissa Payne, I emailed several times and I literally just never heard back. And after it was probably six or seven weeks of over seven, I would say between six and 700 emails by the time we sent them all to the different people. I, if there was a tiny even glimmer of hope that I would be able to do something, I would have continued. But it was just heartbreaking for me and I, it was becoming very exhausting because I had absolutely no response from anyone, but I was still working with all these mums and families and the airline on a daily basis to make plans. Um, and I just, that's the problem. I didn't, I don't even know where the blockage was because I just simply heard nothing. Um, thank you. And, and um, all your time and effort is, absolutely to be commended. And I'm just trying to delve because we have the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade next. So, you know, we can, uh, I'm trying to just investigate. So I just want to clarify, you yourself didn't have conversations with the embassy in the UK. Um, that was being done from the airline. Uh, and Correct. I was yeah. just trying to have conversations from the Australian side in terms of, of the government. Yeah. Okay, um, and I just want to um, check um, with the Jeffries. I am. Um, it must be so frustrating, and I appreciate that you have been trying to get home since March. So, you know, the comments that you're receiving via social media about, you know, it's your fault, it should, cannot be condoned or tolerated. Um, 
uh, and I think I can feel your frustration at the continuous um, cancellation of flights. I just want to check as well with you because the, the caps, the entry caps are, are placed on at a state level. Um, have you just been seeking to return home to Perth or have you also looked at the other avenues as to whether it's flying into Sydney and quarantine there and then return home? Yeah, so we have been looking at all available flights, um, particularly paying close attention to the flights flying through uh, Japan or, or Hong Kong um, and trying to get back into, into Sydney. Um, none of those flights have presented themselves as, um, as being good alternatives for us um, at this point. But yes, we certainly have been very open to flying into some of the other capital cities. Um, but as mentioned in our opening statement, you know, flying anywhere but into Western, Western Australia, flying into Western Australia is a preferred option for, for some of the reasons that, that Carly mentioned, because we have family that can drop off a hot chair or that they can you know, give us a microwave so that we can heat up food for the little guy. Um, our preferred option is definitely Western Australia. That gets compounded when we see, you know, that the sun closure in South Australia with, you know, that going into lockdown. If, if we had arrived in South Australia, we would just be restranded um, and we'd potentially be worse off there than we are here. Um, we have looked at other options, but our preferred option is Western Australia, which is why we're flying the wrong way around the world by Doha to, uh, to try and land in our home state of Western Australia. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, thank, Chair. Oh. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, Senator Rice. Thanks, Chair. And look, thank, thank you all for, for presenting to us today. And, and I really feel for you of what you have gone through. And, and Carly, sort of representing so many others, sort of what, yes, these families with young babies have gone through. It's just heartbreaking. I had my first question, um, Dave and, and Kate, I was... Can you tell me more about the sort of the, the pressure basically to say that you were you certain about whether you really wanted to come home? Because I think that's extraordinary given what we have heard from the, the stories of people overseas. Uh, sure, I can go first and then pass over to Kate. I mean, it, it wasn't a long involved conversation. I was actually quite surprised to, to get a call. They introduced themselves as, as being from, from DFA. And they were just wanting to go through and, and uh, check their, their, their list. And are we still planning to return to Australia? I said, yes. So you are wanting to come back to Australia? I said, once again, yes, we want to, um, we want to come back. Um, um, we want you know, we, we come back tomorrow if, if we could get on the flight. Um, then asked if we would like to return by Christmas. Uh, at which point I uh, just reiterated we would come back tomorrow if there was a uh, My experience was very similar to Dave's. They were pretty much the exact same question and the exact same answer. It's, it's extraordinary. I mean, essentially, yeah, it's clearly under pressure from these people that they had basically promised were going to come home by Christmas. And it's very clear that there are going to be tens of thousands of people still stuck overseas. So trying to trying to get you off that list of people so that you can claim that you know, people don't really want to come home after all. But, yes. Um, um, Pali, your, sto your stories that you shared of the parents with newborns and particularly that yeah, it's an eight month old child having to sort of be there in the smoking area for just 15 minutes a day. I mean, having been a, a parent of kids before and just thinking about being cooped up in, in a hotel in four walls with, with young kids, it's just, yeah, it's just awful. Um, I just wanted to know how do you and the other of families that you're in touch with, how do you feel when you see others getting special treatment? You know, whether it's the Prime Minister being able to sort of home quarantine on his return home, or as you say, all the other, you know, celebrities or people who have obviously, you know, got particular reasons as to why they can, they, they have a different process than, than what you and the families that you are, are working with have to go through. <laughs> It's just very unfair and I think that's not just families, that's every Australian that's stranded overseas and 
we're not silly. We understand that's pumping money into the economy at the end of the day, but it's not fair that they get that and we don't just because we can't pay privately for it. Um, it was interesting seeing the photos of uh, Scott Morrison in quarantine after Japan. Again, you know, I understand why he was posting those photos to show that he was, but the poor people stranded in Japan just saw him fly in, fly out, <laughs> and then be able to just home quarantine. And I did wonder who took the photos. If you're in complete quarantine and isolation, <laughs> then I do wonder who took the photos. Uh, A few of to us Paris. wondered. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think for the families, again, we're happy to be in quarantine. We know we need to be in quarantine. Um, we want to protect other Australians, but we just we don't expect to be celebrities and it happen privately. We're just asking for some basic human rights, a tiny place, a kitchenette, some fresh air for our children. If it was just, you know, one or two of us, it's still awful that you don't have fresh air. But I can't explain to an eight month old why she's not going for her daily walks. I can't explain to her why she can't just breathe a bit of fresh air through the window or, or look out of it. Um, so it, it, it's just very unfair when you when you see that um, plastered all over the news and especially when people, you know, recently some celebrities kind of snuck in and we we found out about it. So it's obviously being done behind the scenes, which they obviously know that it's not right <laughs> when that's happening. <laughs> Thanks, Carly. And Fiona, I'm so pleased that you have finally made it home after hearing from you um, <laughs> at our previous hearing. Can you tell me, though, how many, people are, how many people are still stuck in India that you're in touch with who haven't yet made it home? Thousands? I, I don't know, but thousands. Like, I would think five or 6,000 people on the flight um, I talked to lots of people in the lines and things. Some of them were like me, had been there waiting since eight months. They'd been there and couldn't get out when the um, lockdown started to happen. And others had were people that had left in the last few months um, for family reasons. Dying parents were the um, most common thing I heard people say. And then they were returning. And they were on a DFAT flight returning. Um, so I don't know how they choose us. It was just a lottery, maybe. I, do, I really don't know. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it's all a bit of a mystery the way it was yeah. going. I'm so thankful to be one of the lucky people. I thought that I would never get back because out of India, there are no commercial flights. There's nothing. There's the options of going through America. You, on all the chats, you hear people talking and they're rapid with trying to work out how you could connect up and actually get to the far end. Um, the last time I got um, cancelled from a commercial flight, I rang them up and I'm saying, so what's happening? When, when are you going to, you know, can you slot me in? And the guy was like, we don't know. We, mm. we cannot promise you anything. We can't promise you next March. We have stopped promising a seat. Which is so, yeah. So I would have stuck there forever. Tragic, and particularly for people who are so desperate to come home and to yeah, be reunited yeah. with their family. And at the time when the rest of the country are, you know, celebrating and we've got our zero cases here and everyone's got that feeling of you know, joy and of things opening up. Well, I'm like Carly's grandmother, you know, I'm the, I'm the grandmother and my littlest ones don't remember who I am. We talk on the telephone, but you can see them thinking, who is that blooming woman? You know, they don't. They were babies, and so there's no grandparent in their lives. I'm the only grandparent that they've got, uh, uh, grandmother. So for some of them, yeah. Mm. Well, I hope and, you'll be able to see them again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no. Thank, Thank you, you Thank Senator you. Rice. I, I'm conscious we are a bit over time. We really um, appreciate all three of you, or actually four of you, plus Mitchell attending today. Um, just. As a final question, yesterday the Prime Minister was um, asked to defend the use of a RAAF plane that's currently flying a private citizen, former uh, minister in this government, around Europe for meetings um, seeking a position with the OECD. And one of the reasons he gave about the need to have that private plane being used was um, that um, Mr Corman couldn't attend or couldn't fly via commercial flights because he would likely get COVID. Um, and that's why a private plane has been used. Perhaps if I start with you, Ms Wright, um, what's your, as someone who has contracted COVID in, whilst trying to get home, what's, um, how, how do those comments make you feel? 
it's appalling. That's an old, you know, old friend, old mates club. Why mm. can they spend so much money? Why are they not at least putting a few of these poor people that would like to come back on that plane to come back out here at the end of it? That's just appalling. And they've not put much into any of this at all. We paid more than triple, double the price of a, a normal ticket on this assisted Qantas flight. Mm. You know, yeah, appalling, really appalling. There is a lot of people, not just after a job, after their life, to come to their home country. Thank you, Mr. Wright. I'm not sure, um, Dave, if you'd like to comment. You said that you'd paid, or you would be in sort of $50,000 of money spent in your attempts to get home. You're not home yet. Um, do you have, have anything you'd like to say to the committee in response to that? Look, I, I think using our AA resources to fly people who are in need of being able to being able to or who are in need of a return flight home would be a, a very good use for uh, planes such as that. Um, flying one person um, is just an utter waste of time. There's money and using COVID as an excuse when they're allowing um, us to be stranded over here is, is utterly appalling. But I would have to say, though, from all of the decisions, the decision to allow the Indian cricket team and their families into Australia when we cannot get back into Australia, we found that utterly disgraceful. Thank you, Mr. Jeffries. And Carly, is there anything else you'd like to say to the committee before we let you go? No, nothing surprises me these days <laughs> with who's allowed in and who's allowed out. Um, but I'd like to also um, back up the Jeffries with the DFAT call. I had exactly the same call um, last week. I was told to hang in there. <laughs> and, um, it, and the same thing, are you moving back permanently? Would you like to come back for Christmas? Um, and I sort of, it's almost like they don't know the situation. They haven't been fully trained in, in what's going on. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that I had exactly the same call and many of my fellow um, families also had the same call. We were all very confused by it because it didn't actually offer any help. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, in terms of, of the plane, I mean, again, it's fine for myself to risk flying over, you know, with an eight month old to meet my family because he won't actually let my mum come to see me. Um, but also it reiterates why we're getting so much hate and almost feel like we land and we're kind of prisoners with the plague. If that's the kind of thing that the Prime Minister is saying to Australians that you can't get on a flight because you might catch COVID. No wonder we've got Australians saying, stay where you are, don't bring your COVID over here. Yeah. <laughs> like, so yeah, I have nothing further to add Thank you, though, for your Thank time. Thank you really very much. It. Well, Fiona and Carly, we're so pleased you're back on Australian soil. And to the Jeffries family, we can't wait to hear that you're uh, back, um, hopefully, on the 19th or 20th of December. We'll, we're all thinking of you and um, sending you our support. And hopefully some of the questions we have uh, in the next session um, may answer some of the questions that you have as well. So thank you very much. and. Um, to the committee members, uh, we'll have a short recess and we'll resume the hearing at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.
commitments hearing into uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And I uh, thank witnesses appearing today um, and for departments appearing together. I understand we might uh, begin, even though I understand Ms Foster will be appearing. She's just running a couple of minutes uh, from a, the late appointment or her last appointment. So um, can I thank the departments of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Foreign Affairs and Trade, Home Affairs, Health, and infrastructure, transport, regional development and communications. Um, in the interest of time and considering the number of departments appearing, we would prefer not to have opening statements, but if there are, is information people would like to table as, as opening statements, um, then the committee is happy to have those and we can work from them. Is there... Uh, Senator Alison Frame, uh, Deputy Hi, Secretary, Ms. Social Frame. Policy Group. We have prepared one opening statement across all six departments, so right, that okay. there's not six opening statements, and yep. it's it's pithy and direct. If you would like us to, um, Mr. Sheehan can present that. Verbal. Okay, that no, sounds like I a fair be, fair enough. I will be quick, yep. Chair. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you, and we appreciate the effort that's gone into keeping it streamlined. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senators. Tony Sheehan, Deputy Secretary, DFAT. Australians overseas continue to be affected by the impacts of COVID-19, including border closures, travel disruptions and a resurgence of the virus in some parts of Europe and around the globe. DFAT is on the front line, speaking to Australians every day, and we know it is difficult for those looking to return home and for those whose loved ones remain overseas. With the other agencies represented today at this hearing and through our overseas posts, we're working hard to get these Australians back as soon as possible. This includes as many as we can before Christmas. A DFAT task force is focused on bringing Australians home and the agencies here and others contribute in many ways to helping Australians to return. Almost 426,600 Australian citizens and permanent residents have travelled into Australia since the government recommended that people reconsider the need to travel abroad on 13 March 2020. Of those returning since hotel quarantine commenced on 28 March, around 1.3 per cent have tested positive for COVID-19. To support quarantine arrangements, weekly international passenger caps were introduced in Queensland, Western Australia and South Australia, um, with New South Wales now uh, at a weekly cap. Weekly cap capacity is 5,625 arrivals, uh, rising to 6,745 arrivals with the resumption of arrivals into Melbourne on 7 December. Importantly, there is also additional surge capacity currently in place under various arrangements in states and territories. Numbers have varied over time, subject to agreements at National Cabinet and decisions by individual states and territories to accept additional arrivals on compassionate grounds. Since the pandemic began, the Australian Government has, directed, has directly assisted over 30,000 Australians to return home on more than 369 flights. 72 of those directly facilitated by DFAT and a further 62 administered by the Department of Infrastructure under the International Aviation Network Support Program. Since the Prime Minister spoke on 18 September, 35,932 Australian citizens and permanent residents have returned. More than 14,000 of these were registered with DFAT, including approximately 3,100 vulnerable Australians. As at 24 November, there were 36,875 Australians overseas registered with DFAT as seeking to return. We have said before the number registered would increase based on changed circumstances in which Australians found themselves over time in an uncertain COVID-19 impacted world. DFAT will continue to organise facilitated commercial flights, including from Europe and India, for the rest of 2020. We're also helping many Australians home on scheduled commercial flights from across the world. To support Australians overseas, the DFAT administered hardship program has committed around $9 million to 1,772 applicants, covering the cost of accommodation, subsistence and flights. Global circumstances are constantly evolving and so are the circumstances of Australians overseas. Not every Australian we offer a flight to is able to accept the offer. Many need time to sort out their affairs or have medical or logistical issues preventing them from accepting an offer. 
and some of those who registered with us do not wish to return to Australia at this time. It has proven difficult at times to identify those urgently wanting to travel from our registered list. Uh, for example, one flight took over 1,800 phone calls and emails to fill. To ensure we have a clear and timely understanding of people's circumstances and intentions, we've asked Services Australia to call on DFAT's behalf all Australians overseas by family groups who are registered as wanting to return. This will help us target our assistance to those most in need. DFAT will continue to work with agency partners to assist the return of as many Australians as possible, so both before up. Christmas and continuing through the new year and into 2021. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Sheen. Can I hand now to Senator Keneally? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that um, opening statement. Um, so just to go back to the numbers update, uh, you said that the number of stranded Australians overseas sits at 36,875, is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Uh, yes. Um, that number has doubled since the 20th of August then, when there were 18,800 Australians overseas? That's approximately correct, Senator, yes. And which department is responsible for tracking that figure? DFAT is responsible. Senator. And how is that communicated to other relevant departments? Uh, we communicate that regularly to other, uh, other relevant departments. We provide that information uh, roughly three times a week, Senator. Right. Is there any kind of working group then with these departments? Uh, Senator, uh, uh, I convene a group as the Deputy Secretary mm. in Prime Minister and Cabinet. I convene a, a IDC yep. that meets three times a week yep. where all the relevant Deputy Secretaries you have before you today and other officials yep. meet and discuss progress, what issues okay. are top of mind, and Tony provides a report three times a week, Mr Sheehan, on where the task force is up to. Thank you. Uh, what are the top five countries in which stranded Australians are located? I'll give you that detail, Senator. Number one on the list, Senator, uh, is India, uh, UK, Philippines, Thailand and South Africa um, are, the, are, the five, are the five countries uh, listed uh, at the top of the list in terms of people registering wanting to return. Right. You said in your opening statement it has proven difficult at times to identify those urgently wanting to travel. You said one flight took over 1,800 phone calls and emails to fill. Where was that flight coming from? Uh, that one was from the United Kingdom, Senator. Right. Thank you. Um, how many of the uh, thirty? Uh, how many of the uh, thirty-six thousand eight hundred and seventy-five stranded Australians are classified as vulnerable? Uh, currently, we have on the vulnerable list, Senator. I'll just go back and make sure that I give you the correct figure: uh, eight thousand and seventy. Sorry, could you repeat that? Eight thousand and seventy. I believe the last time we had a hearing on this, the number of vulnerable Australians was 4,000. Uh, I'd have to go back and check what the exact figure was uh, at the last hearing, Senator, but the figure, the figure we have registered currently is 8,070. Might be helpful, Senator, if I mm. uh, provide a little bit more detail uh, on how that occurs. Uh, individuals register. Uh, with DFAT seeking to return mm -hmm. uh, and based on the information they provide, uh, we conclude whether they fit the vulnerable category. So essentially they are self-assessing. In some cases we will know a lot about those individuals. If they're acutely vulnerable, uh, they could be uh, a consular case with us where we'll have a lot of detail. Others, uh, others we will uh, learn more detail as we go. Okay. Um, I should add, if I may, Senator, that what we are discovering when we contact uh, individuals on the list who are vulnerable, because what we are doing is prioritising those who are vulnerable wherever we can to get them on flights. In some cases, uh, they don't take up the opportunity for a mm. flight. There can be very good reasons for that. There can be absolutely legitimate reasons. Like they've reasons. contracted COVID, uh, for that, example. Well, that's, that's, one, right that's, that's, one, that's one example. But there could be others too, Senator, as to why okay. they can't travel, other health can reasons I just, as well. And I apologise, we are short on time with this hearing. Um, 
I just want to confirm, at the last um, hearing we had, we heard that 4,000 of the stranded Australians were vulnerable. On the 20th of October in Senate estimates, we heard that there were 4,000 vulnerable Australians. Uh, and I believe it was Ms. Frame in answer to questions from Senator Wong, who said the objective is to get the 4,000 home, all the vulnerable Australians, and as many as quickly as possible. Are we going to get all 8,000 vulnerable Australians home by Christmas? Senator, can I just clarify one aspect of that? The 4,000 was the number that was the number current at, on the 18th of September when the Prime Minister spoke directly about returning vulnerable Australians and made that he commitment. He didn't talk about vulnerable Australians, he talked about stranded Australians. He uh, made a commitment to return as many Australians home by Christmas and that is the commitment that we have been continuing to work towards. But as Mr Sheehan has explained, numbers move, people's circumstances change, so that number has constantly shifted. It's grown. Um, yeah. and it's not just shifted, it has grown. Senator, when it, it may be helpful it for the doubled, committee... It is doubled, in fact. Yeah. Senator, it might be helpful for the committee to understand also that often we are dealing with family groups. So what you will find is that one member of the family is vulnerable, and the rest of the family are not in the vulnerable category, but we will not split families. So as a result, we will bring home that family. So we are prioritising vulnerables, but we won't split families where there's a vulnerable person when we bring them home. You haven't answered my question. Are we going to get all 8,000 vulnerable Australians home by Christmas? We, we will bring as many of those people home as we possibly can, Senator. Uh, we will do everything we can and we are prioritising vulnerables both on facilitated commercial flights that we organise mm -hmm. and if we are provided uh, surge capacity or any additional capacity, last minute seats that become available, we will always do everything we can to prioritise vulnerables and we will bring home as many as we can. Surge capacity. Who's going to provide the surge capacity? Well, Surely the federal government. We're, no, we've been, we have surge capacity uh, in jurisdictions now, Senator. Mm -hmm. That has allowed for facilitated commercial flights to arrive in the Northern Territory. You're aware that one flight uh, has arrived or is about to arrive mm -hmm. here in the ACT today. Uh, there are advanced negotiations with Tasmania for facilitated commercial flights to right. come there. And we also have been given additional surge capacity where we get additional people on scheduled commercial flights uh, where we can use that space to prioritise vulnerable Australians. I'm going to come back to the specific mention of surge capacity as it's referenced in Ms Halton's um, report, but I want to stick on this point for the moment. Um, how many DFAT repatriation flights will be scheduled before Christmas? How many Australians will be on those flights and from what countries will they depart? So, Senator, uh, to this point, uh, we have had uh, a total including uh, the flight today of eight facilitated commercial flights since the 22nd of October. Uh, we have uh, additional flights coming from New Delhi uh, to Darwin on the 27th of October. Uh, and we will be... Sorry, that are coming or have come? Sorry, pardon me, New Delhi New Delhi to Darwin uh, will arrive on the 28th of October. Pardon me, that was an incorrect date. Uh, oh, it did arrive? It pardon did me, did I, have I yeah. been, did I just say October? Yeah. Yeah. I apologise, Senators. No wonder, you were, no wonder you were saying, has it already arrived? No, that was, uh, that was my mistake. I intended to, uh, I intended to say November. Uh, we will have uh, several more flights arriving before Christmas. We haven't yet announced from where they will come, uh, but they will be announced shortly and it will become evident where they are coming from. And then we will have further flights also uh, scheduled immediately after Christmas. Okay. I, I want to turn to the Prime Minister's um, statement on the 18th of September regarding bringing stranded Australians home. So the Prime Minister said at a press conference on the 18th of September, I would hope that those who are looking to come home 
that we'd be able to do that within months and I would hope we could get as many people home, if not all of them, by Christmas. When the Prime Minister made that statement, how many stranded Australians were there? On the 18th uh, of September. On the 18th of September, there were 26,200 people mm -hmm. uh, seeking to return registered with DFAT, Senator. And since he's made that statement, we've now had an increase of 10,875 stranded Australians and a doubling of vulnerable Australians. And I, I should say that what occurs, Senator, is that some people who are on the list who were not vulnerable might become vulnerable yeah, over the course of time, which sure. accounts for some of the well, some of the numbers. They're uh, running again, out of money, they don't have jobs, they don't have accommodation and they're living yeah. in the northern hemisphere, many of them, where winter is coming. I can imagine they're getting vulnerable. But but again again, Senator, we are also finding in some cases when we contact people, uh, they are not not necessarily wishing to take up a flight immediately, which creates challenges, uh, as I mentioned, in respect of, of some of the flights. Not, not in all cases, of course, the majority of people uh, wish to take up flights, but we are finding that. So it's important, uh, it's important to note that, that uh, people have registered for a variety of reasons mm. uh, on the list. Uh, and we can't make the assumption that, uh, that everybody on that list actually wants to return at this time, which is why we're trying to ascertain that information to make sure we target our efforts as well as we can. I'm going to come to the, your targeting efforts. Um, uh, of those 26,000 Australians uh, that were stranded on the 18th of September when the Prime Minister made his um, statement, his promise, how many of those 26,000 Australians are already home? Statement, Senator. So he, that directly correlates, does it? Which, no, it does, Senator. No, it, it, I, it doesn't. I don't right. think uh, it the does. The number yeah. that I the number that I provided, Senator, is both people who had yeah. registered before mm -hmm. 18 September and people who have registered since 18 September, noting uh, that we have people who've registered since 18 September. Uh, who are in the vulnerable category, and we're making sure that we do prioritise vulnerable, but we also look to prioritise those before 18 September as well. But right. just, just to be clear, Senator, they're of the 26,000 to... At the statement on the 18th of September, since that time there have been, as, as referenced in Mr Sheehan's opening statement, 14,000 Australians who have returned home who were on DFAT lists. Now, whether they so you're were telling me those 14,000 who have come home since then were on a DFAT list? Yes, yeah, so there are four, since, the, since the 18th of September, Senator, 14,000 people registered with DFAT have returned. Right. But the, num the list has also grown since then? That's correct, That's correct. Senator. Yes. Okay, so 14,000 have returned, but we still have about 38, a little over 38,000, close to 39,000 who are on your list. So we, we yes. do that okay. so with the number that I gave you in the statement, Senator, yep. is the number that we have on the list. Okay. Now, the Prime Minister clearly said to the Australian people that he was going to try and get all these folks home by Christmas, which means the drop-dead day for them to get into Australia in order to celebrate Christmas with their families is the 11th of December. We've got a, clicking, a ticking clock here. So can you tell me how many Australians will be home by the 11th of December? Senator, we, we are not working on the basis that we will not continue after the 11th of September. Our job to get Australians home has been a job that we have been doing uh, in DFAT and across government all year. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, we have brought many people home and we will continue that effort right up to Christmas and we will continue scheduling flights and getting people on planes noting that that means that they will in some cases be in quarantine through that period because our efforts to help Australians must continue. We will endeavour to get as many people as possible from our list home by Christmas and we will continue our work, Senator. I'm not suggesting you're not going to. I'm just trying to understand if you have a view as to how many people are going to be able to get home, how many stranded Australians. Because this is the other point, isn't it? You've made a few times, reference a few times about prioritising. Mm. 
But it's not necessarily the case, is it, that every quarantine spot goes to a stranded Australian? Senator, I, I, we, know, we know that a far, a far larger number of Australians return to Australia than just those on the DFAT list. And they won't be on our list because I'm they can I'm talking about return. people on the business investment visa. I'm talking about people on the CEO list that get to come in on temporary visas. Uh, Senator, I'm talking about people like Tony Abbott, who gets to jet around the world twice now. Those, each of those people takes up a quarantine spot. Uh, do you have any process in place to privilege or reserve the quarantine spots for stranded Australians in the lead up to Christmas in order to be able to deliver on the Prime Minister's commitment to get these people home. Senator, if I can open there, and it may be that Ms Rendina from Australian Border Force can provide more detail around other people who are entering and exemptions that are being granted to enter Australia, and those numbers are very small, but Ms Rendina can provide more information on that. Um, I just would also point out that there are many more Australians returning to Australia than are on the DFAT list, and many of those Australians may also consider themselves to be stranded Australians, and very, I'm, I'm sure they are very eager to return to Australia, and they are returning and they are uh, in quarantine in states and territories and recipients of quarantine place. But Ms Rendina from Australian Border Force can provide more information pursuant to the categories you mentioned around chief executives and other business travellers. Uh, good morning. Uh, Kylie Rendina, Acting Deputy Commissioner for the Australian Border Force. Um, I can uh, provide you with um, about 89 per cent of passengers who are, arrive are Australians and permanent residents or auto approved. Those people who are auto approved include immediate family members of Australians and permanent residents. The discretionary exemption categories comprise about 11% of the travellers that come in to Australia. That includes, um, of that 11%, 60% of those come in uh, with critical skills. 25% uh, of those come in with compassion and compelling circumstances, such as attending funerals. Uh, and then the other 15% of that 11% are national interest or critical med medical skills or urgent medical treatment. So my question is, is there any plan whatsoever to preserve that 11% in the lead up to Christmas for stranded Australians, for Australian citizens? Um, can I just add, Senators, that um, with the government facilitated flights, and um, uh, Mr Sheehan might be able to um, um, add some more to this, there's a lot more control that's able to be applied in who goes on. With the commercial flights, it is a matter for airlines, um, and we work with airlines as much as possible, but it is a commercial decision. And at, at, at the risk of repeating myself, Senator, our, the people registered with DFAT who we are helping to come home are only a subset of the Australians that have returned. As I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, since 18 September, 35,932 Australian citizens and permanent residents have returned, which indicates many more are coming that are not on our list. And we would expect that they may not need to be on our list because they have a way to get back in. So the numbers are, are much higher. We are, we are a subset of that, helping the people who need help. Time come for this session. This yes, section I'll has come, come to, to a conclusion. Thank you. I'll come back to you, okay. Um, Senator Rice. Thanks, Chair. Look, I want to continue asking and just get some clarification about these figures and how many people are likely to come home before Christmas. So we've got the 36,875 people on your lists, of whom 8,070 are vulnerable. Um, just some clarification. So that number of 35,000 that you just mentioned, that is in total the number of people that have returned, and then and that includes 14,000 on your list since the 18th of September. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. So the people on the DFAT list then, we've had 14,000 returned since the 18th of September. That's just over two months. That's 7,000 a month. Is there any reason at all to believe that you're going to have considerably more than that 7,000 in the next month of those 36,000 36, who are on your list? Senator, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, 
we see because of the surge capacity being provided by the states and territories, uh, we would expect just through the surge capacity as it currently stands uh, alone will give us uh, approximately another 2,400 uh, places to bring, uh, to bring Australians home, prioritising vulnerable Australians from our list. Uh, and as you would expect, efforts to see if more surge capacity can be achieved with states and territories is ongoing. In addition, many of the people from the DFAT list will also come home on scheduled commercial flights. And a lot of those will be able to do that with the assistance of DFAT as well, because our offices all around the world are working with the airlines to try and get people onto aircraft. Often that can be when seats become available at the last minute or they have tickets and they're able to get on. Uh, that is a worldwide effort. I would say of this, Senator, we are aware of the acute situations of many Australians. This is the most complex consular effort DFAT has ever undertaken. We will get as many of those people on the planes as we can. Uh, I can't give you an exact figure, uh, but you can be assured that we will be looking to use every last seat that becomes available to make sure that that is the maximum number possible and we will get that as high as possible. Senator, if but even with that Oh, sorry, I just wanted yes, to add on. two things um, to remain to your question, Senator, which are two things that will make a difference to our ability to bring more Australians home over the next, uh, in the lead up to Christmas. The first most significant one is Melbourne Airport coming online again on 7 December. Premier Andrews has written and made it clear that they will be recommencing their quarantine program on 7 December. That will obviously make a significant impact on numbers of Australians that are able to return before Christmas. And the other significant input that will make a difference is border decisions, domestic border decisions that have recently been taken by premiers and particularly in Queensland that will free up more quarantine capacity also for returning Australians. So those places that are available in quarantine at the moment will be able to be filled by passengers returning from overseas. So they're just two significant factors that go directly to your question about our prospects of increasing the numbers of Australians returning home in the lead up to Christmas. But even with those factors, you're talking about the extra surge capacity of 2,400. So again, on average, if it's been 7,000 in the last month, that might bring us close to 10,000 in the next month. And in, in fact, we haven't got a month to get people actually being able to sit around a Christmas table with their family because they're going to be in quarantine two weeks before then. It seems to me that we are still looking at probably having 25,000 or so Australians stranded overseas at Christmas time. Uh, Senator, there will be numbers of Australians still overseas after Christmas and we will continue efforts after Christmas to bring Australians home. But would your expectation, given all of these factors and the extra surge capacity opening up in Melbourne or airport, that will bring the numbers up to you know, maybe 15,000 people? over the next month that are able to come in from your list. That's still going to leave 20,000 Australians stranded overseas. S Senator, That's correct, isn't it? Senator, could, could I, in response to that, I think an important point to make is that uh, people, people register with DFAT when their circumstances uh, dictate to them that they should. Uh, that, that is not something that's unexpected. The circumstances uh, that people are confronting can change. They may have been in a situation where they did not wish to return and for matters that might relate to family, work, financial situation, health, uh, they decide that they do need to return. So it is expected that we would see more Australians join the list and that we will need to continue this effort. I mentioned before, this has been the biggest consular effort we've ever made. It has been running all year. Uh, we, we, don't, uh, we don't stop. We have to keep helping Australians and that's what, uh, that's what we will continue to do. Yep, I, I understand that. What I want to know is, and can you confirm for me that those rough calculations that I've just done accord with your expectations, that you would expect that of those 36,000 people that are currently on your list, that something, you know, 20 to 25,000 of them 
are not going to be home by Christmas. Senator, our expectations of ourselves are as high as they can be. We will get everyone we possibly can get home by Christmas. We know that there are going to be many Australians who are not going to be home by Christmas. We will do everything we can to, to understand uh, those, uh, those who are urgently seeking to return to make sure that we are not attempting to get people back who don't wish to. We will get can, everyone, can ask, every possible person, Senator, will get back. Can I ask it in another way, just to finish off, is there anything wrong or that you think is, is inaccurate in the rough calculations that I have just been putting to? S Senator, we can't, I, I can't take, I can't give you a specific number uh, because there are so many variables, and uh, and you've heard uh, you've heard Deputy Se Secretary Frame make that point already. If more capacity comes online, we will use it. If more surge capacity comes online, if we use it equally, if we have a situation like occurred in South Australia, that can also impact our ability to bring people home. So yeah, I, okay. it, would be, it wouldn't be right to try and put a number on it, but you can be guaranteed we will not stop for a second trying to get every possible person off the list home. Look, uh, quickly, um, we've heard about the phone calls that you've been making to people on the list. We heard evidence earlier that some people actually saw them as being rather pointed phone calls that seemed to be um, encouraged them to say that they didn't really want to come home and they didn't really want to come home by Christmas. Um, are you aware that that's the impression that those phone calls have left with people? Um, and secondly, how many of the, the people of those 36,000 people on the list have, have you reached with those phone calls? Thank you. Thank you for the, the question, Senator. Um, we, we concluded that it was important that we try and contact everybody on the list as it became evident to us uh, that Perhaps early on we had assumed that everybody who was on the list would have uh, uniform requirements as to when they might want to come home. That was incorrect and we were finding that when we were contacting people or seeing you know, a particular cohort and thinking that that would be a group that would, uh, would want to come home. We have the quarantine capacity available to us that we have. We have an ability to put on facilitated commercial flights to try and get people on flights. So what we have done, so, sorry, Senator, we're, let me. We're short of, yeah. we're short of time. I understand, so sorry, sorry, sorry us, Senator, I'll, get, I, I'll, 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 move, I'll move forward with this quickly. So we have partnered with Services Australia and ask them to ask simple questions of people uh, to seek advice uh, that they still wish to return and do they wish to return this year. Now, I should say, if they say that they don't wish to return this year, they remain registered on our list, but it tells us that they don't wish to get on a flight this year so that we can target them uh, best, all our flights best to help people get home. What we also do is make sure that those people understand very clearly in making the phone calls and, and they've been briefed that they will be dealing with people in very difficult circumstances. They are sympathetic, but they are asking simple questions. We also ask them to make sure uh, to ask people to state where they are and to register family members as well so that we're ensured that we have family members on the list. Then if they need to refer people, they can refer them to support services at Services Australia or they can okay. refer them to our consular uh, emergency call centre so that they can speak directly with a consular officer. Uh, in answer to the final bit of your question, uh, we are going through the initial data. Uh, so far, uh, we have been able to work through the data for about 5,500 people who've been called. Of those, uh, somewhat less than 20%, a little less than 20%, have said that they don't wish to come home this year. Uh, very few of them, however, have said that they don't wish to be on our list at all, and the rest of them have said that they wish to return this year. Uh, that's, a, that's at this stage, it's, it's early in the evaluation process, Senator. Okay, so you've only reached 5,000 of those, or have you, have you, is, is it only 5,000 that you've analysed? It's only, it's only 5,000 we've evaluated. 
but have you reached more than those 5,000? How many phone calls have been made of yes. those 36,000? Um, more, more phone calls, uh, more phone calls than that have been have been made, Senator. And I will look for the number here of how many people have been called. Um, I believe so far there have been 20, almost 23,000 uh, call uh, call attempts. Um, and the successful uh, connections have been to 6,100 individuals and family groups. I can't tell you exactly how many people that represents because the family groups will be of different sizes. But uh, what I'm telling you about, Senator, is only what, we, uh, what we're confident of the evaluation of so far. Thank you. Okay. Senator Yes, I've got a final question. Okay. I just wanted to ask, in, in brief, in terms of the limitations on, on bringing people home, how much is it flight capacity and how much is it quarantine capacity? Because I was under the impression, very much in previous evidence, that it's really been the quarantine capacity which has been the limitation. Is that still the case? Uh, that's, that's correct, Senator. And so then what is the government, any of your departments, currently doing to be working with the states to actively increase that quarantine capacity so that we can get more of those 36,000 people home, if not by Christmas, absolutely as soon as possible. And that, Senator, where we're working with jurisdictions to increase their quarantine capacity, for example, ACT and Tasmania have agreed to take flights. That means that represents an increased quarantine capacity than existed prior to those jurisdictions accepting flights. Um, and Northern Territory, as you know, has agreed to 500 people a fortnight through Howard Springs, which represents a net increase in quarantine capacity. And when Mr Sheehan has referred to surge capacity at any point in time, that's where jurisdictions have agreed to take additional people because they have a quarantine place to support that. So any surge capacity is correlated directly to a quarantine spot being available. And that that constitutes states and territories making additional quarantine capacity available in response to requests from the Commonwealth Government. Is the Commonwealth providing any extra financial support to the states and territories for quarantine capacity? Uh, the Commonwealth is providing financial support, as you know, through the National Partnership Agreement. Um, mm -hmm. Has that increased? Is that planned to increase over uh, the coming months? We are certainly working directly with Tasmania and the Northern Territory Government to provide an increase in support for their quarantining arrangements. Yes, Senator. So can you then take on notice or tell me now, what's, what's the increased financial support then being provided to the ACT? In the I'll, I'll take that on notice, Senator. Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Chair. Thank you. Senator Patterson, am I coming to you? Thank you, Chair. Yes, please. Um, can I start and say thank you very much to all the DFAT officials and other public servants who have been involved in this massive logistical exercise. Um, probably none of you imagined that you would be quasi travel agents when you join the public service, but that's what you're doing. And, and to get 30,000 Australians home in just the last few months is a, a huge undertaking. So thank you. Noting that um, that's a good start, but obviously we've got more to do. Um, yeah, clearly, this is a, is a diabolical public policy problem in that we've got an absolute obligation to assist every Australian who wants to return home to do so, but equally we have an obligation to protect Australians who are home um, from COVID being reintroduced. And the Victorian experience shows how easily it can be reintroduced through hotel quarantine from overseas. Mm -hmm. Um, just want to talk about that Victorian hotel quarantine failure and the consequences it had. There, there's obvious consequences uh, for Victorians who went into extra lockdown and the massive economic and social impact of that. But also Melbourne Airport closed as a returning uh, route for Australians. Um, how big an impact has that had on the ability to get Australians home? Um, Senator, I can answer that question. It's had a, a very significant impact because prior to the closure of Melbourne Airport, it was taking approximately 26 per cent of international arrivals. So. Um, the impact has been commensurate with the proportion that they were taking prior to having to go offline. Mm. And um, I know that it's, it's due to open again on the 7th of December and take about 1,000 people per week. 
Um, so that's almost six months since it closed. Um, had Melbourne Airport been taking a similar amount, say about the 3,000 a week that New South Wales had been taking in that six months, th that's give or take, by, by my rough maths, about 70,000 extra people that could have come home in that time. I mean, given the numbers we're talking about of, of 36,000 outstanding Australians overseas, that's an enormous blow to our ability as a nation to bring people home, isn't it? Christine Dacey, Deputy Secretary, um, Aviation and Airports. Um, the reality is that um, Melbourne going offline was actually almost the trigger for the caps. Before that, uh, through the beginning of the pandemic, there was no cap system in place. The, the arrivals were being managed and quarantine was being managed, but when that particular element of the quarantine system came into place, that was actually the trigger for caps being introduced. Right. And, and that was a unanimous decision of the National Cabinet, as I understand it. And am I right in remembering it was a request of the state governments? Uh, it wasn't. At that time, it was not a National Cabinet decision. It was a request from Premier Andrews, direct to the Prime Minister, that we cease international arrivals uh, into Melbourne oh, while sorry. they reset no, their quarantine clarify. program. Yes, no, sorry. I was, I was talking uh, about the caps being introduced. Uh, the caps uh, then sort of flowed in an evolutionary sense, like once Melbourne went offline, uh, the pressure commensurately filtered through the rest of the quarantine systems of jurisdictions, and that's how we arrived where we are. Of course, of course. Um, just following on from Senator Rice's uh, question about what is the remaining major constraint, um, that's right, as Senator Rice is putting it, isn't it, that the major constraint is these state-based quarantine caps? Uh, well, the, the reality is, um, you know, for health reasons, for a, a, a range of very legitimate reasons, we, we are seeking to control the entry of people who have been overseas for a period of time. Quarantine is the constraining factor, yes. Mm. And, and did I hear correctly evidence from an official that um, Australians travelling interstate over a state border which is closed have been taking up places in hotel quarantine that could have otherwise been filled by an Australian seeking to return from overseas? I'm not an expert on the internal workings of uh, jurisdictional quarantine arrangements, but certainly uh, when various outbreaks have happened at various times, we have been advised by the states that their resources are being spread across various quarantine requirements, which may include domestic quarantine requirements. Professor Kelly may have more that he wants to add, I don't know. Um, yes, so Professor Paul Kelly, Acting Chief Medical Officer of the Department of Health. Um, that's correct, Senator. There has been an effect from the domestic border closures uh, in that way. So some states have, uh, have needed to decrease the number of, ca of people they've been receiving overseas because uh, there are others in hotel quarantine. On the other side, we, we have uh, gone ahead with one of the key um, uh, recommendations of the Halton Review and looked at ways we could relieve uh, the quarantine burden and that relates to the green zone uh, arrangements with New Zealand. So uh, in the first month of those happening from the 16th of October till the 22nd of November there's been 68 flights in from New Zealand uh, and 5,269 people, many of those Australians uh, returning from New Zealand have come into the country quarantine free. There's been no cases uh, related to those New Zealand flights. Uh, there's been uh, some health checks at the border, particularly, uh, well, firstly in Sydney and more recently in Melbourne, uh, and some people yeah. have, have received tests, they've all been negative. But that's 5,269 people that didn't go into quarantine and, and uh, opened up capacity for others. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and just to confirm, Professor Kelly, on that issue of the state border closures, the NHPPC, has it ever recommended to National Cabinet that state borders should be close to each other? Um, the the uh, AHPPC, I think you're, you're referring Sorry. to. Not, uh, so the Australian Health Protection uh, Committee has, has not made decisions about domestic borders. They've been a matter for the states and territories. Indeed. So if a state um, government has decided to close their border to other Australian states, and therefore require Australians to quarantine uh, when they want to cross state borders, taking up places of international uh, Australians overseas. That, that's a decision that they've made, and it has, but it has had an impact on Australians seeking to return overseas, has it? Uh, that's, that would be my understanding as well, Senator. Right. Um, so Professor Kelly, it's, it's good that you're here because I'm interested in testing on behalf of these Australians who are overseas um, some of the alternatives, because uh, when I correspond with Australians stuck overseas, 
one of the things they say is, you know, couldn't I just quarantine at home? I'd be happy to wear an ankle bracelet. Um, I'd be happy to have an app. Um, why is it that Australia hasn't gone down that path? What are the risks of going down a path like that? Well, I think it's been, you mentioned yourself, Senator, about the, the situation that was faced in Victoria in the past few months. And we've, we've seen uh, what happens with even a small breach in, in relation to hotel quarantine, how quickly things can develop. Um, in even just in the last uh, week or so, we've seen something very similar, but uh, a very strong and appro appropriate and uh, quick public health response in South Australia dealing with exactly the same issue of quarantine, uh, for quarantine breach. Um, we, we have, of course, in the Halton Review did talk to, uh, did recommend that we looked at alternatives to hotel quarantine. Uh, we have looked at that in great detail. We've provided uh, information through, uh, through the various mechanisms for decisions. At the moment, it's seen that uh, um, uh, that risk uh, is not acceptable in terms of decreasing from our gold standard of hotel quarantine. Uh, now, th those, those things can be explored later uh, again, but um, that matter was taken to National Cabinet uh, and, uh, and the, that discussion was had uh, and that was announced after the last National Cabinet where that landed, which was essentially staying with what we've got. Yeah, and, and Professor Kelly, uh, you probably won't have, have much difficulty convincing Victorians of that, um, who went through what many uh, see as a completely unnecessary second uh, quarantine, a second lockdown because of hotel quarantine failures. And it's very frustrating um, for those Australians stuck overseas that as a result of that failure, we've had to introduce a much more stringent regime, close down our Melbourne airport for months on end and impacted their ability to return home. Well, well there's been uh, certainly the, the uh, situation as it, as it evolved in Victoria um, has made people uh, more cognizant of the risks uh, and uh, that's certainly affected decision making, I, I do agree. Um, the, the, these things are not necessarily the fault of one person or, or a particular state. These are the matters of, of this particular virus. It's very infectious. It can spread from person to person. It can spread on surfaces. And uh, we're continuing to, to examine that at the IHPPC about what extra things we can do to make hotel quarantine safe. Uh, and you know when when the time is right to consider what might be alternatives to, ho to hotel quarantine. Of course, there are some, and the, the ACT is an example of, of of that jurisdiction where where alternatives have have been used successfully uh, in terms of home quarantine with very rigorous and specific uh, follow up of people, uh, making sure that they're complying with that uh, what is required in terms of staying at home. Um, but other states uh, believe that the that the hotel quarantine is is the one that they want to stick to and, and we need to respect that. They're the ones that are running those services on behalf of the nation. Indeed, and I, I think ultimately they bear responsibility for how many of their own uh, state residents that they can welcome home. We, we heard evidence this morning from uh, Australians who are seeking to return to Perth that they have a particular additional difficulty getting home because of those state border closures, um, that the number of flights that are available to them is far narrower than any other Australian seeking to return home because they don't want to quarantine twice and they don't want to have the difficulty quarantining on the eastern seaboard and then struggling to get back into Western Australia as well. They were saying they had to go the wrong way around the world via the Middle East to try and get a flight direct to Perth. I mean, isn't there an obligation on, on states like Western Australia, which put in these extra and higher um, restrictions, uh, to increase their hotel capacity? I mean, I, I note the Western Australian government is only accepting 1,000 Australians per week. Um, that's only a third of what, uh, what the New South Wales government is doing. C can't states do more to accept more Australians? Well, those are decisions for, for the state governments. I can't um, second guess uh, the premiers and, for, and uh, chief ministers what they will decide, but they, they have to look at the capacity they have. Um, it, it has to be realised that hotel quarantine is, a, is, is quite complex. Uh, they, the ones in South Australia, for example, are run like hospitals to an extent. Um, a lot of staff, both health, um, uh, the usual services that happen in hotels around food and cleaning services, et cetera, plus the security elements. Uh, and, and they are, uh, that has to be the, within the capacity of the particular state or territory uh, to do. And, and they're the ones that are taking that responsibility and they need to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. 
Indeed. Um, and just a final question for me uh, from a hope to Home Affairs or Border Force officials who are there. Um, one of the other suggestions that people have made is, well, why can't we use uh, detention facilities um, more uh, extensively uh, to bring Australians home by there? What, what is the capacity in our detention facilities at the moment? Do we have spare capacity to bring Australians through if we had to do it that way? Senator Patterson, we're just waiting for... Um Official to... So can I just clarify, yeah. Senator Patterson, Thank you. you say other people made that recommendation? I think it was Jane Halton that made that recommendation, wasn't it? Well, I was talking to Senator Keneally about the many Australians overseas that I've corresponded sure. with who are, um, as you know, very keen to come home and, and open to all possibilities to get here, and that's one yeah. of the suggestions that I've received. Yeah, I think it is also a recommendation of Ms Halton. Okay, we've got Ms Rendina in, in place now. Hello. So to answer your question, uh, there is no capacity in detention centres at present. Uh, COVID-19 um, has affected the ability to remove unlawful non-citizens, so we are over the capacity. Um, and as you would be aware, while we used uh, the Northwest Point on Christmas Island uh, initially with 278 Australians returning home, um, the, there was a health assessment uh, for any other um, expansion on, on Christmas Island that determined that uh, the detention facility there was not health appropriate for a quarantine facility. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Um, can I go now to Senator Keneally? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to stick with quarantine for a moment, please. Um, uh, now, I, I just want to go to the Jane Halton report. Ms. Halton is, of course, a former secretary to the Department of Health and the Department of Finance, and she's completed a national review of quarantine. Uh, Ms. Frame, um, in September, you told this committee that the quarantine capacity on which everything rests, the capability to bring as many Australians home as possible, is a responsibility that resides with the states and territories. Do you stand by that statement? Well, Ms. Halton, uh, not only believes that the federal government can operate quarantine facilities, she believes the federal government should operate a quarantine facility. Who is right, Ms. Halton or you? Uh, what Ms. Halton recommended was that the government, Commonwealth government, look into where they might be able to augment and support quarantine services. And I note that she specifically called out Howard Springs as a highly suitable facility to be scaled up and to provide surge quarantine capability. And the Commonwealth, since Ms Holton's report was released, has worked directly with the Northern Territory Government to expand the capacity of the Howard Springs facility. And Ms Edwards and Professor Kelly might have more detail about ongoing negotiations with the Northern Territory to go Government to continue to expand that capacity in Howard Springs, which Ms Holton specifically um, set out as a highly suitable facility for the Commonwealth to work with the Northern Territory Government and support an expansion of quarantining. Let me just go to what Ms Halton actually said on page 31 of her review. She said, with a large number of Australian citizens and permanent residents currently offshore, we need the need to significantly increase arrival numbers. Consideration should also be given to the establishment and maintenance of a national facility in reserve to facilitate large-scale evacuations from international ports if or when required. I think it's good that Ms. Halton has recognised that quarantine is and can be a federal government responsibility. What action has been taken to progress that recommendation of Ms. Halton? Uh, as I said, Senator, immediately subsequent to Ms Holton's report, we worked directly with the Northern Territory mm. Government to take up their, an offer that they had since made to expand the capacity of the Howard Springs facility. Professor Kelly might be able to provide more detail about the national facility that that constitutes there. It is, in fact, directly in line with what Ms Holton suggested in her report. With, with respect, Ms Holton seems to be making the observation. She says elsewhere that this is... a uh, an urgency because of the arrival of winter in the Northern Hemisphere. She seems to be quite clearly suggesting that Howard Springs is not enough. She makes a recommendation about a national facility for a surge capacity to get people home. So what are you doing in response to that recommendation? And Howard Springs has served in that capacity, Senator, when the emergency flights were undertaken from Wuhan earlier in the year. The point I have made previously, and has since I'm asking been expanded. what you've done in response to this. this she, she is clearly making a recommendation you need to do more. So since 
her report, Senator, we have expanded the capacity in Howard Springs by 500 per fortnight. Mm. And as I've said, my health colleagues can provide more information about the national centre that that constitutes and the national effort and how we are continuing our, our continuing negotiations with the Northern Territory Government to look at expanding that capacity even further. Ms Edwards. Secretary Health. So in relation to Howard Springs, as Ms Frame says, 500 people per week is now in place. There's a national agreement about that which is publicly available and we are in very advanced negotiations for an additional 500 per fortnight, per fortnight I should say, 500 per fortnight to come on on place soon. In addition to that, we canvass with all the states through our colleagues uh, for other options and that's why we've looked at the ACT which has come online today and the facility in Tasmania that's coming online shortly. Uh, they are complex discussions to make sure that the benchmarks such as are set out in the Holton Review are met with those facilities and really important to work with our colleagues in states to make sure they're integrated with hospital systems and all the other issues. We have to make sure communities are um, are comfortable with what's happening and work through it. And we are open to all suggestions which would have a rigorous assessment from a health point of view and all the other issues that are relevant. Uh, but we are open to working with states on additional facilities wherever they might be appropriate. Now, Ms Halton did say that travellers can be quarantined under Commonwealth or state legislation. So it's not just augmentation, unless you want to tell me that Ms Halton is wrong in making that statement, that the Commonwealth can quarantine people under its legislation. Senator, there's obviously scope under the Biosecurity Act and other legislation to do things unilaterally, but we don't work like that with quarantine. It's something that happens in a state, wherever it is, and has to be integrated. And for, for example, in the Northern Territory, one of our major concerns was to make sure that the hospital capacity for Territorians, including, as you know, very vulnerable Territorians, is there available, even if there were to be, in the worst case scenario, an outbreak or a couple of people or a larger number of infected mm. people than we'd expected. So working with the state to make sure the quarantine facilities in their jurisdiction work for them, for their existing populations and balance the risk of having 1% um, at least of returning travellers infected with COVID, plus all the other vulnerabilities and health issues they have, uh, can work Sorry. with the existing capacity. But you do acknowledge, because it has been said here previously, that this is a problem of the states and territories. You do acknowledge the Commonwealth has the legislative power to set up these facilities. Senator, uh, can I just clarify, because you might be referring to statements that I made at the previous hearing. Yes, with you, I am. Where I, I quoted I, them. I frequently referenced the National Cabinet decision in March, mm -hmm. where the decision was taken by the National Cabinet that the quarantine approach applied would be through public health regulations from the states and territories. They would mm. use their public health force workforce, they would use their police forces, augmented by ADF support, which was freely offered by the Commonwealth. So what is the Commonwealth's role in all this, honestly? So as I You're said- You're just shoving everything onto the states. We're working very collaboratively with the states. Mm. We are providing ADF and ABF support in every jurisdiction mm. to support the quarantining arrangements that states and territories but are providing. Not, not, I mean, M Mr. Pizzullo was here last time and said you were ready to do anything. You had buckets of money. You were ready to go. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of evidence of that. For example, Ms. Halton said the Commonwealth could set up a human health response zone in order to set up their national facility. And, and since that time, Senator, we've set up 500 places per fortnight in, in partnership with the Northern Territory Government. As Ms Edwards said, that's not going to that get is these, very nearly The Prime expanded. Minister said on the 18th of September he was going to get these stranded Australians home by Christmas. That is not going to happen. He said he would get as many as possible home and we are continuing to work daily towards that goal. He and said also, he wanted them all home. Minister Hunt said five days earlier he wanted them all home. I don't see any actual evidence that the Commonwealth has put a plan in place to actually get them home. I, there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of meetings, there's a lot of collaboration. There is no actual plan to get 26,000, now 38,000 Australians home. Senator, there's also a lot of flights happening that Mr Sheehan has detailed. There has been a lot of Australians mm. returning home. There has been a lot of additional quarantine capacity through but it Howard hasn't Springs, through ACT, problem. through Tasmania. So there has Did been Did you not see the Jeffries family? They've been trying to come home from Canada with their young son. They're about to lose their job. They're paying, they're running out of money. They've got $50,000 worth of bills. Why aren't they home? Why aren't these stranded Australians home? Surely, I mean, my goodness, Germany has brought home 187,000 um, of their citizens. Canada has brought home 25 or 50,000 of their citizens. The United States, Donald Trump managed to bring home 100,000 Americans. 
Senator, I think we only have 30, we only had 26,000 when this started. Senator, I think Professor, I think the Professor Kelly... I think brought home 426,000 Australians, yeah. actually. And there were 26,000 stranded Australians when the Prime Minister said he would get them home by Christmas. That has not happened. Senator, since that day, haven't we brought home okay. over 30,000 okay. since that so No, if, okay. if you would let me answer... Thank you. Sorry, Ms Frame. Senator Davey, let's just take it down a notch and just let Ms Frame answer the question that was put to her. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, I just wanted to say that um, in response to those points you make about other countries, Professor Kelly may be able to provide more detail here as well, that the success of the Australian, um, the COVID situation and the public health status um, is the, our single most effective public health intervention thus far as agreed by the AHPPC, as I understand it, Professor Kelly, is the hotel the success of the hotel quarantining program. So the other countries that you're referring to are not in a similar situation to us with regard to their COVID status. And we are working within the constraints of an effective, a safe and effective quarantine program, which has made a significant impact to the public health outcomes and economic outcomes in Australia to bring Ms. as many Holton Australians home as possible. make recommendations didn't Ms Holton say that the hotel quarantine was not sustainable? Didn't she make recommendations about a risk assessment approach based on countries of origin? Didn't she make recommendations about, about home, uh, uh, home quarantine with monitoring devices? Didn't she make recommendations about standing up a national facility for surge capacity? And since she made those recommendations, Senator, the, we have introduced a green zone arrangement for New Zealand flights in line with their status mm -hmm. as a but she largely COVID-free country. We have created that quarantine capacity in Howard Springs. Professor Kelly, is there anything you would like to add here? Yeah, I, I'm very interested in your country comparisons, uh, Senator Keneally. Um, I'm sure if we asked the Australian public, they would not want to have the same sort of pandemic experience that the countries that you listed just then were having. But Ms Halton has given you ways to get people home She safely. has, yes. I'm not asking for a free-for-all. I'm saying you've got your own hand-picked expert who has given you a report a month ago on about ways you can get these people home safely. Yes, and we've done, we've done that work, as I mentioned mm. in my previous statement. We took it to National Cabinet. The time was not seen to be right to be changing our current Where's situation with hotel quarantine. Uh, that was a decision made at National Cabinet, which was announced after that by the Prime Minister. It included all of the state mm. and territory first ministers in mm. that decision making. Mm. We're, we're continuing to do that country risk assessment, as was suggested by Senator Holton, and uh, that that information is you know, will mm. be made available at the, at the time when it will be needed to be actioned. We've already done the green zone, as we mentioned. That's an extra 5,000, more than 5,000 people that are able to come into hotel quarantine. Um, we've done the work in terms of Howard Springs that have been mentioned by my colleague, uh, Ms Edwards. Um, so all of those things that were mentioned in those recommendations and more uh, by, by Senator Holton have been done and, and or are continuing to be done. Can I ask this question, please? The Premier of New South Wales has made comments in the last few days uh, that she would like to see more of the quarantine spots being provided for international students and uh, skilled uh, temporary visa holders. Is it possible for her to unilaterally make that decision, therefore removing quarantine spots that might be available to stranded Australians? Um, at the moment, Senator, the National Cabinet, of which Premier Berejiklian is a member, have agreed that the priority is returning Australians and that consideration will be given to international students and other, other groups when they're in a position to do so. But mm -hmm. the standing decision of the National Cabinet at the moment is that all priority has been accorded to Australians returning home. Are you saying the Premier of New South Wales is bound by that decision? She's a member of the National Cabinet. That's not answering my question. Is she bound by that decision or is she legally it possible for her to take a decision that she's going to provide a portion of her capacity, I think she suggested up to a third, for agriculture workers, temporary um, skilled visa holders and international students? Um, I don't think I can provide more detail, Senator, than that she is a member of the National Cabinet who have collectively agreed to prioritise returning mm. Australians at this point in time. Mm. 
Um, um, just before I wrap up this particular section of my questioning, I want to go back to two issues that were raised earlier. One uh, to Border Force, please, about detention centres, immigration detention centres. I accept fully the uh, proposition you have put about the capacity constraints at um, operating or currently open detention centres. However, Port Hedland, Woomera and Baxter um, Port Hedland was closed in 2004, Wilmer in 2003, Baxter in 2002. What is the status of those? Could they be used? Uh, so I don't have um, specifics around those particular sites. I need to say that uh, we have evaluated a number of locations and all have been deemed unsuitable for quarantine purposes. Why? Professor Why have those three been deemed unsuitable? Professor Kelly might have some information there, Senator. Mm, thank you. Um, so, uh, the, as, as has been mentioned, I think, by, uh, by Senator Patterson, th this is a, a difficult policy conundrum, Senator Keneally, which mm. we are all... That's why you see so many departments represented at this committee. Um, we have two, co two actually competing... Well, at least two competing policy objectives here. One is to protect Australians that are currently in Australia from this global pandemic. Um, the second one is to get Australians home uh, as soon as possible. Both of those things are absolutely vital and we're working on both at the same time. When those Australians come home, we do need to continue to protect um, the wider public of Australia and that's why we have kept with hotel quarantine uh, and, and uh, put in place all sorts of protections to make sure that, um, that the virus does not spread uh, further. But when people return home, as we've seen, they have many needs um, as they come. The vulnerable Australians, um, many of them are vulnerable because of their health needs, because of their other needs, including mental health. Um, some of them are disabled. Mm. Uh, they need the sort of, the, the, the sort of uh, services that all Australians should expect to have uh, when they're currently in Australia. So um, these are some of the issues uh, related to having to setting up these types of facilities in remote areas. Can the I, the can main I, point, though, is really to keep, keep, that, keep, keep people safe mm. uh, whilst they are there and, and the wider population. And so there, need, there are some needs for, for that in sure. terms of keeping people isolated. In the interest of time, can I put on notice then, I would like to know if Head, Port Hedland, Woomera and Baxter has been, have been considered. They might not be appropriate for the type of people you're talking about, Professor Kelly, but there are 36,000 people. I'd like to know if those three have been considered and why they haven't been um, used. Senator will take um, I will cease at this point for this session. I've got another section of questions. Um, Mr Sheen, just before I head to Senator Seawit, a um, couple of things. Uh, you say that it's, I think in answer to Senator Keneally and Senator Rice, you were saying how difficult it is to put a figure on how many you would expect to come home by Christmas. Are you, are you saying that you don't have any um, idea of that at all. Um, I, I just find that a bit hard to believe for planning purposes that it's you're, you're operating in a vacuum. Senator, we have we are able to plan around surge capacity where we do facilitate the commercial flights. And I should add, I missed one before. Uh, we have another one coming in. Uh, from London on the 30th of November, and I'll get the month correct this time. Yeah. Uh, those, those flights, we can work with the airlines to get people who are registered with DFAT on those flights. With scheduled commercial flights, what we have in some cases, and we're seeing it at the moment with Queensland where surge capacity is being provided, is an ability uh, to get a portion of that flight dedicated yeah. to us. Where we, where we do not have certainty is around how many people who are registered with DFAT will be able to get on registered commercial flights under the caps. We often don't know until they come back that they have come back because we're working very quickly with airlines trying to match up people with seats with airlines and the airlines are very helpful in this work with our consular officers. We can't forecast exactly how many seats we are going to get going forward that would give us, give us a meaningful number. As I said before, Senator, we will, we will get as many home as we can. Um, and if I may, I, I noted uh, with respect Senator Keneally's comment that she doesn't see a plan. 
to get 14,000 people registered with DFAT Home is the result of planning to use every capacity available to okay. us in a coordinated way to get sure. as many as we can. Okay. So I can't give you an exact number, okay. but well, you're seeing the results. What numbers can you give me, Mr Sheen? I, I, I just find it very almost impossible to believe that you are not working from a set of of some numbers, whether it's surge capacity, if you can give us surge yeah, capacity, so, so Senator, give us surge, those numbers. So, Senator, surge capacity, uh, with the surge capacity uh, that we have now, we expect to get another 2,400 people home by Christmas. Uh, you heard Associate Secretary Edwards talk about the potential for more capacity at Northern Territory. That would add, uh, if that comes online, potentially another 445 to that number as well. To the uh, 2,400. To the 2,400. And then anything else we can achieve with states and territories by way of surge capacity over and above the present surge capacity, we can then use either for a facilitated commercial flight, an additional flight, or to add people to an existing scheduled commercial flight that will enable us to prioritise vulnerable people, people from the DFAT list. Okay. Then the number that is uncertain is those additional people from our list who will also join scheduled commercial flights. That's that's the number that we cannot give to either do it on their own or with your or assistance. Or with our assistance, right. yes. And okay. so yeah, sometimes we where we're successful we may know the day before that we've got certain people on a flight. Um, talking with our consular officers, this is a this is a constant effort. Often they have been working with an airline to get somebody on the flight, bearing in mind that our officers may not be side by side with the people they're assisting. Yeah, sure. uh, we won't find out until after they have okay. come back. So I, I say again that we will get as many as possible home by Christmas. You know, we are aware that, uh, that we are, you know, there are high expectations of us to do it. We will get as many as okay. possible, but I can't give you a number. So the number that you, is absolutely definite within the Commonwealth's control based on repatriation flights that have been agreed to is 2,845. Is that, that right? That would so be that. That took into account. That takes into account additional capacity at Northern Territory yes. if it comes on board. Yes. But Senator, that is. I mean, the so that case scenario. Schedule commercial flights. Are a, you could look at them as a, they're a big pipe into Australia. Sure. They're very significant. So while I can't predict the numbers, those are very significant numbers, yeah. and you can okay. see you can see that from the numbers that we've already been able to bring home from our list, who are of course only a subset of every okay. Australian coming home. But you, would, I'm just I'm trying to understand in terms of the Commonwealth absolute control. The flights that you are going to, the repatriation flights, you've got one from New Delhi, one from London on the yeah. 28th and the And then the we will 30th. have further flights that we haven't, we haven't announced Why yet. Why haven't they been announced. announced? We're working through logistics at the moment to make sure that all the arrangements for those flights are in place so that we will be able to ensure that passengers are actually able to get to the flights. To give you an example, Senator, the flight that came into the ACT today connected potentially with 20 different ports to get people on that flight to get home. So we have to plan carefully to make sure that we're actually setting up flights that will enable people from our list to get on them and sure. get home. So think, you'll see more You'll okay. see more shortly, and I'll find out if we've announced any more even today, uh, if I can, by the end so of the year. So are they currently waiting ministerial announcement? Uh, Is that where they're at? Uh, no, it, we, we will we will announce them based on on readiness to be able to put uh, to put tickets on sale and assist people to get okay. on the flight. Because uh, uncertainty is a big thing here that we're hearing from people overseas, I, not I, knowing. The, and Senator, I'm, I wouldn't I'm, want it to be held up I, for. I'm sympathetic to that, yeah. Senator. We announce them as early as we can, okay. looking to maximise people getting on there. And I think you're going to see very significant numbers between now and Christmas join uh, join that 14,000 as having returned, but it, I just okay. cannot give you a number. Can I just... So, so, Senator Gallant, I've just, I can give you just a sense of the relativities, the regular scheduled, commercial scheduled flights. Would that assist the committee? It's May. So, 
Uh, as Mr Sheehan said, with the facilitator, the government facilitated, we've got the, the much greater level of control yep. about who can come on. But just in terms of seats that are available yep. under the caps, yep. uh, and we do not distinguish between people who are on DFAT's lists and we do not yep. distinguish. Seats available to return. That's yep. right. It's in the vicinity of 29,000 between now and the 25th of December. And noting earlier evidence that a very large proportion so of that 29,000 will be Australian citizens or permanent residents returning. So you've got to take Mr Sheehan's work as well as kind of the the much bigger capacity that's available through the 140 odd flights, 170 odd commercial flights that are coming in each week. So that's how you get to your global yeah, number. Sure. Okay. Well, we're getting closer to to a number um, based on that. And there's lots of you know variables that sit inside that. Sure, I understand that. Um, so when um, the prime minister in a release, I think uh, in the following National Cabinet on the 13th of November said, between now and Christmas, we expect to bring in an additional 27,000 Australians home. What, um, what advice was he working from for so, that figure? So it would be a combination of exactly what Mr Sheen and I were talking to you about, his um, government facilitated, and the numbers that we would expect to come through the normal commercial channels. So you're expecting um, about 26,000 I, I always talk about it in terms of a band um, because what I can never control is what will happen to any individual passenger or their family. I can never control okay. what can happen inside any state quarantine system and I can never control what can happen within an airline like a plane going unserviceable okay. or something. So who would have provided the Prime Minister with that figure? The, we have been working together, uh, DFAT and ourselves, on the cap capacity and the, the scheduling of the facilitated flights. Okay. So that would be um, that would not necessarily be um, stranded Australians though. No, we do not in the commercial world we, we, we do not distinguish between people who are on the DFAT list uh, and in fact we don't distinguish between okay. Australians and non-Australians but what we are seeking to do through the cap arrangements is get as many people to have access to a seat, a commercial seat that would have access to a quarantine place uh, and that's how you get okay. to the, that sort of macro number. How many um, repatriation flights between now and Christmas? So like, I'm not, I'm not asking for where they're coming from or anything like that, but how many you've got? We've, Senator, we've announced two so far. Uh, I won't give a specific number because we're still uh, in negotiation with, uh, with the Northern Territory, as you've heard, and others, but there will be several before Christmas. Uh, and in some cases, uh, decisions are made if further uh, surge capacity comes online. A decision has to be made, is it best spread across existing scheduled commercial flights or is it best to look at a facilitated commercial flight to maximise our ability to get vulnerable people mm. home? So I won't put a specific number on it, but there'll be several more. Okay. Senator Seawitt, can I go to you? Thank you. I wanted to go then to the issue first up, just continuing on uh, that line of questioning. In terms of the 29,000 flights by Christmas, is that actually by the 11th of December in order, in order for people to quarantine before Christmas or is that 25th of December? Senator, can I just clarify? There's not 29,000 flights. There's 29,000 no. seats available no, that are attached to a Sorry. quarantine that's... place. Um, yes, and no, it is, Sorry. it is for into and including the 25th of December. So we okay. have so our, our calculations many... have not stopped on the 11th. Okay. So how many then? How many seats are available in order to get to Australia in time to be with their families on Christmas Day? In so, other words, by the 7th of December. So there's this 29,000 roughly, I, I, you know, I always try and talk in a band, but uh, roughly 29,000 seats coming into the country on um, re regularly commercially scheduled flights and there are about 30,000 empty seats a week because of the quarantine capacity issue. So you would have to add the two to get the total number of aircraft seat coming in commercially every week. So... Can we go to the tw to the twenty nine thousand seats that are available? You obviously know when th that they're, they're that's the capacity yes. coming in. 
before Christmas. Correct. Do you have a weekly breakdown of that? Is that? Uh, I could take that on notice. Uh, the only caveat I would put on it is if you had had this conversation with me two weeks ago, I would have said 600 into South Australia. Uh, and that was that goes to my earlier point about I cannot control what happens with uh, international airlines and I cannot control what happens inside uh, quarantine systems domestically, but uh, I'm happy to take on notice and provide to the committee our very best understanding of what seats uh, in the next uh, four weeks. Okay, that'd be, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Um, but yeah, for the 11th of December, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. In terms then of, just so that we're really clear, the number, the number of capped places in quarantine includes allocation for others that aren't included on the list in terms of stranded Australians. I'm not an expert on that. I, I don't know how the states calculate um, what proportion of their quarantine they seek to reserve for other purposes. I couldn't, I couldn't speculate. Uh, Senator well, you know that there's 29, you know that there's 29,000 seats, uh, yeah, 29,000 seats based on the caps and quarantining. Uh, so how do you calculate, how do you know that? We, we base this number on the National Cabinet agreed uh, caps with the states and territories. So we work okay. from an agreed position from First Ministers and then we allocate seats on the basis of that agreed position for quarantine right. places. Okay. So at National Cabinet, is it discussed how many of those cap seats will be made available for stranded Australians? I think it's understood that it's the vast majority, um, Senator. Um, yes, Senator. As um, there's different categories there within that. So at National Cabinet, they agree that the priority, as I said, is returning Australians, Australians returning home. And as Ms Rendina has clarified, that is the vast majority of people on flights coming in, are approximately 89% are exactly that, returning Australians. And as we've also provided numbers today, a significant proportion are returning Australians who are on DFAT consular lists but the state governments don't directly control how many people come into their jurisdiction are on a DFAT consular list. They set their cap capacity um, and then the international flights arrive in their jurisdiction with, as we've acknowledged, around 89% returning Australians and the, as many as we are able to secure are people on those flights who are also on the DFAT list. So do you have discussions with the states around the DFAT list and securing the spots, particularly those that are vulnerable, on the vulnerable, the 8,000, what is it, 8,070 on the vulnerable list? Do you have any negotiations or discussions with the states about ensuring that they have a priority for quarantining? Senator, um, my colleagues would be able, will be able to provide more detail for you on that. But what I can say um, clearly is that where a flight is a facilitated commercial flight, as Mr Sheehan has explained, DFAT have arranged the, a, a number of those flights and will continue to, we have a lot more control over the people who are sitting on those planes and there is a much higher proportion of Australians who are on DFAT lists. Um, and the other category where we have a lot more control and exert that control and work with states and territories to make sure that we are getting more of those seats filled by Australians on DFAT consular lists are where states agree to a surge capacity. So where states commit to us, we'll take an extra flight or we'll take an extra 10 people per flight equals 300 per week. Um, those different jurisdictions have made different offers that have been very gratefully received. We are able to use that surge capacity to put a higher number of Australians from DFAT consular lists onto those seats. Mr Sheehan, would you like to provide that, more detail? That, that's, that's actually a very good way to look at it, Senator, where, where uh, a state or territory provides surge capacity then you can assume it is their expectation and our expectation 
that we'll be prioritising vulnerable people, people from the DFAT list to fill that surge capacity. So I think that is a good way to look at it. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that can be done by facilitated commercial flights, but it can also be done on scheduled commercial flights. A good example of that uh, was after the terrible explosion in Lebanon, uh, where we were able, using scheduled flights, to bring in several hundred people from Lebanon into New South Wales with an agreement with New South Wales. Okay, thank you. Um, so I understand what you've just said about the surge capacity. It sounds like there's less ability to negotiate with the states around the vulnerable, those on the list, and particularly the, those on the, uh, on the vulnerable list, uh, for, for if they're coming in on the scheduled flights, that there's a there's not so much capacity to negotiate with the states that they're that they're prioritised in the cap. That, is that a correct understanding? That is correct, Senator. Uh, essentially, the airlines are commercial uh, entities that make their own decisions about who they carry on their aircraft, and we do not have a legal power to compel them to carry a certain type of passenger. But, but from what you've I understand that, but what I under, what I've understood from previous evidence, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the limit is the caps. That is correct. The limit is the cap. Okay. So, if a commercial airline can bring in more people, if it, particularly those on the list, if if their pro places are prioritised in the states, could they not? If if the people on the list are prioritised. If vulnerable are prioritised by the states in terms of quarantining, those people could get on those flights. It, it doesn't quite work that way, Senator. The states can't. The states may well say um, we've we've set aside certain quarantine places for vulnerables. In which case, we would then work with DFAT and the airlines effectively on carrying them sort of almost above the cap. We work in a very cooperative way. Um, but it's not the business as usual practice. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to ascertain that's as right. to whether the states do that, but they're not doing that. Is that correct? Oh no, I think the states are trying to. Uh, I think certainly uh, WA, New South Wales, Queensland, uh, South Australia, and uh, Northern Territory and Tasmania have all uh, sought, particularly over the last several national cabinet meetings to engage in that conversation and engage in that sort of arrangement and return arrangement for vulnerable Australians. So I think I, I think initially with the caps, that was not how they operated, but I think that they have evolved a little bit and as has our relationships uh, with the airlines and our ability to become more nuanced in how we use the caps. But okay. there are limits to what we can compel inside the caps. Senator, I'd, I'd agree with Deputy Secretary Dacey, there are good relationships with the airlines. They try and assist us. I mentioned before an example of, uh, of a state or territory assisting, and there, there are uh, obviously more such examples as, uh, as uh, Deputy Secretary Dacey uh, has said. Uh, but uh, we find with the airlines, if seats become available, our relationships with them enable us to get people onto flights at the last minute. Uh, under the caps as opposed to surge capacity. Uh, we've also got uh, a team as part of the task force in DFAT whose job it is to scour for tickets. So if anything becomes available, we try and match any ticket that becomes available. And frankly, that's very difficult as you, as you know, but if anything mm -hmm. becomes available, we don't want to go into waste. We try and match it with someone from our list. Okay, thank you. In terms then of particularly focusing on the 8,070 vulnerable uh, people on the list, is there an expectation that they will be able to be home uh, by Christmas as soon as? We we will prioritise them. We will prioritise them, Senator. As I said before. Um, we have more control over our ability to prioritise them on facilitated commercial flights and as part of surge capacity than as, uh, as Deputy Secretary Dacey described on the scheduled commercial flights. 
so we will do everything that we can. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier on, one of the reasons when you when you look at the the numbers and you see that we have 3,100 vulnerables of around 14,000 having returned from our list is because uh, vulnerable people are part of family groups, so their family group mm. will return with them, we don't split them. Um, and sometimes it is hard, you know, vulnerable people will have very legitimate reasons for having to pull out of flights at the last minute and we just have to try and try yeah. again. Okay, thank you. Can I move uh, just a couple of questions then about the uh, quarantining and identification of a national site? Is, uh, firstly, is there any work being done to try and identify a national site beyond Howard Springs? Um, Senator, as Ms Edwards explained earlier, we continue to be open to any other um, opportunities or sites that are presented to us from state and territory governments. But at the moment, we are um, very close to expanding the capacity of Howard Springs further. It was pointed out in Ms Holton's report as uniquely and very well placed to serve that function. And we're continuing to in invest in Howard Springs and expanding that capacity. With all, with all to Senator Davey in a second, so just... Okay, I've yeah. got just a couple more around here, if that's okay. In terms then of the... The answer was, we're looking at if state and territories present it. My question was, is there any work, and I'll be more specific in that case, being done by the Commonwealth to identify a national site outside of anything the state and territories may decide that they're going to suggest to you? Um, well, Senator, uh, Ms Randina and others have presented on limitations with Commonwealth sites that have been considered um, and what the constraints have been on those sites. So to my knowledge, but I'll, I'll take it on notice, there's no other sites that are, are well positioned at the moment to be utilised, but I'll take it on notice and see if there's any other okay. sites that meet criteria. Did you, in terms of Christmas Island, you said that there wasn't Oh, the evidence was that it wasn't health appropriate. Is there any work being done or uh, is the Commonwealth considering doing work on Christmas Island to make it health appropriate? Um, I can take uh, that. So at this point of time, there is no work um, being done uh, to look at whether Christmas Island can be used for a quarantine facility. Uh, uh, Christmas Island is currently being used for, as a detention facility. Thank you. Um, in terms of, in light of the issues in South Australia and the approach that was announced yesterday in terms of taking COVID positive uh, people who have who are registered who have been identified as COVID positive to a more a specific health facility, is that is Commonwealth looking at uh, any response to that and modifying any? Uh, suggested approach from the Commonwealth in terms of quarantining. National approach, a nationwide approach. Um, thank you, Senator. So there, there are ongoing and very frequent uh, discussions at the Australian Health Protection Committee uh, about uh, quarantine and how to make it safer. We had a, a detailed discussion yesterday. We've had several discussions since uh, the incident in South Australia last week. Uh, today we will be looking specifically at, at what you've what you've mentioned and 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 looking at what the South Australian uh, Premier announced uh, a couple of days ago now about what they were considering. Um, but each of the states have their own uh, and territories have their own uh, way of doing these things. So so some already have in fact that exact same system that you're mentioning. So in New South Wales that's the case. If anyone is positive, they're taken to a specific facility. Uh, in, in your own state of WA, they're very specifically against doing that. So, uh, as always in the Federation, um, we have this, this, this issue of different ways of doing things, uh, uh, and we need to respect that. The, the states have their own decisions to make for their own people. Okay, thank mm. you. Um, I understand but, that. Yes. But oh, can I finish just on this one? Okay. Just yep. in relation to the Northern Territory, specific 
um, in the yeah, agreement. In of, Sorry, Senator Seawit, Senator Seawit, um, Ms Edwards has just Very provided. briefly, just to say in the specific agreement for the Northern Territory, there's an agreement for people with mild symptoms found positive to COVID to remain in the facility in a particularly cohorted way because they don't want to take them in and mix them with the RDH population and so on. So, okay. as Professor Kelly says, horses Thanks. for courses. Senator Seawit, okay. final. Will it, in terms of then, will there be an announcement following consideration today, Dr Kelly? Uh, well, as, as you know, Senator, the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee is a subcommittee of the National Cabinet, Top and secret. so we'll go Senator through Seward. that process yeah. that has been explained None of many, us are times, to know. many times. Many yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's worth trying. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Davy. <laughs> Senator Davy. Uh, yeah. You. Sorry about the delay in my mute button. Um, thank you all for appearing today. I, I just want to come back and clarify a couple of things. Um, did I hear someone earlier mention that uh, in uh, when we have flights returning, commercial flights returning, that um, sometimes it's a case that people who have tickets uh, fail to show and um, therefore some of the flights are returning with less than all the booked ticket numbers? <laughs> Uh, Senator, there are occasions uh, when people who have tickets are unable to travel. We have instances where people have missed connections. We have instances where they have incorrect uh, documentation. We have instances where their personal circumstances change. And so very unfortunately, some of those happen very, very close to the time of boarding. Uh, sometimes it, we have a little bit of notice, in which case we try very hard and work with our consular uh, colleagues in DFAT to try and find someone who can take the spot that's made available. But yes, there are. And it's just like any normal travel, uh, for a variety of reasons, people miss, miss flights. Uh, and, and it's just uh, entirely regrettable given the CAP system in place. And it's never harder, um, Senator, than during the COVID period um, we see that but uh, where work northern territory for example have where we've had people pull out of a flight going to howard springs at the last minute uh, allowed overbooking of the next flight so that we don't lose anything we're working with Qantas who are uh, doing everything they can with us to see how we create standby capability to minimize that happening but as as deputy secretary Daisy described, it is going to happen sometimes. And part of what we are doing to address that more broadly is that at last National Cabinet, there was an explicit agreement and understanding with the state premiers that we would start over allocating uh, by small amounts on the caps in order to get as close to full utilisation as possible. And we do that in a very considered way because what we don't want is someone showing up and not having quarantine spot to go into. Uh, but uh, we, based on kind of uh, what we're seeing in trends, we, we are now very judiciously and carefully over allocating in agreement and in consultation with the states and territories. And um, are the phone calls that uh, the department are now making to pending travellers overseas. I mean, we heard evidence this morning from a couple of individuals who said they received phone calls from DFAT just uh, double checking that they're booked on a flight and is it their intention to fly and is it their intention to, to stay? Is, is that process also assisting to ensure that people are aware of what documentation they need um, and, and that gives people the opportunity to maybe say, actually, I'm not going to fly you can give my spot to someone else. Is that uh, process helping? No, we're not, we're not checking not checking documentation through that process, Senator. It's quite a it's quite quite a straightforward process to ascertain some basic information. Uh, the the key reminder. Uh, that uh, that the callers do give to Australians overseas is to say make sure that you have identified your location and make sure that you've registered family members as well. That's probably the key thing. If if there's more detailed uh, issues, depending on what kind they are, then they would then be uh, referred to a support service or referred to uh, consular staff in DFAT. Um, and can you give us some advice or, or some context? I know that New South Wales has a far higher cap 
than the other states, I think um, almost threefold to the, to the next nearest cap. Can you give us some indication of how many people have gone into hotel quarantine in each of the different states? Maybe uh, I'm, I'm okay if you have to take it on notice, but if you've got uh, anything there that can help us understand exactly how how much the states are doing in this area and how um, how it's working at the state level. So I can tell you that the New South Wales cap is 3,000, uh, and that is three times higher than any other jurisdiction except for WA, which is 1,025. So it's all but three times higher. The, I don't know about the quarantine. Uh, the other thing, Senator, to note is that on any given night, New South Wales have approximately 5,000 people in quarantine because, as you know, the quarantine <coughs> period is is 14 to 16 days or 14 days and then there's the, the clean up of the room and ensuring that the next cohort can arrive. So you obviously need more than the weekly cap number in your quarantine facility. So on any given night, New South Wales have approximately 5,000 people quarantining. And that would be the same for all jurisdictions where the quarantining number would be in excess, well in excess of their weekly cap allocation. Senator Davey? Um, I just want to come back to, we had evidence this morning from Carly, who uh, has set up the, uh, the Baby's Home campaign. Um, and she said that she had had some very constructive conversations with an airline um, about uh, trying to bring a, a cohort of um, young families back to Australia direct. Um, and she said she'd written to a lot of the politicians, uh, but the airline had been having conversations direct with the department. Um, can I just ask if anyone on the panel is aware of that, uh, both that campaign, but also those negotiations, which um, did not proceed, but uh, for reasons that we couldn't ascertain this morning. Uh, I'm not personally. I'm, I'm aware of the campaign. I'm not personally aware of the discussions that happened, whether it was in the context of trying to charter something or whether it was in the context of a, a normal scheduled flight. So I'm happy to take it on notice, yeah. though. Okay. okay. Thank you, Senator Davey. Um, I'll go to you, Senator Keneally, to finish up. Thank you. I'd like to ask some questions around the phone calls that DFAT has been making to stranded Australians. And first of all, to clarify. Is it Services Australia or DFAT that's making it's, these it's calls? It's a DFAT responsibility, Senator. Services Australia are making the calls. And uh, so when someone the... answers the phone, who are they talking to? They're Services talking Australia. to someone from Services Australia. Right. And then do they get transferred to a DFAT person? They can be. They're, right. Services Australia will ask some basic questions, mm -hmm. but if the person wishes to speak about issues uh, that are not uh, within the capability of that person, sure. then okay. they would refer them, for example, to a support service in Services Australia okay. if they needed that, uh, or to uh, our consular call centre if they needed to talk, to talk to DFAT about more involved issues related to their situation or their case. Okay, thank you. Um, we've also been told by stranded Australians that you're also sending text messages advising people in advance that there will be a phone call. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And is the practice to always text in advance? Uh, I think the uh, the thinking on this, and, and we took advice from Services mm. Australia on this, is to maximise the likelihood that someone knows that a call is coming and, and they're more likely then actually to connect. Right. Um, I know you gave out a, a list of how many phone calls you've made. Can you also, and I'm happy to take it on notice, how many text messages have been sent out? I, I'll have to take it on notice, yep. Senator, but I, I would assume Great. we've sent out as, as many as possible. Uh, so, uh, can I just ask, when these calls are made, um, are they being made in an appropriate time for the recipient? Uh, that, or are they only being made in Australian business No, hours? no, there's, we, we discussed that with Services Australia. They're working extended hours so that the calls should be being made mm. in an appropriate time. If we're getting, um, if there's information indicating otherwise, and I apologise, I couldn't listen for exceptional reasons this morning at 10 o'clock, but I had colleagues who were watching, so if there's feedback that someone got called at an inappropriate time, we'll take that on board. Senator. Well, in fact, I'm happy to um, table 
uh, for you. Um, these are Stranded Australians Facebook posts, posts regarding the DFAT phone bank banking. Now, I've redacted their names because it'll be public course, information. No, but if course. you do need, you need names, I'm happy to provide them. Um, because um, we are being told that people are getting phone calls in the middle of the night um, and that we have also been told that they are waiting up to 40 minutes for a call to connect to a DFAT officer. Are you aware of either of those two um, issues, that people uh, are being I, called in the middle of the night or they're being, wait, they're being on, waiting on hold for 40 minutes? Uh, Senator, the, the, I was not aware of the, of the calls in the middle of the night and, mm. uh, and we will follow up on that because certainly that's not the intent where we are aiming to be calling at uh, time zone suitable times, if I can use that term. Mm -hmm. uh, I will find out also, we'll check on, on call waiting times. Mm -hmm. We've had, I think, 100,000 uh, consular phone calls mm -hmm. uh, since the beginning of COVID, mm -hmm. uh, and we heavily staff um, our uh, emergency call unit and also uh, our mm -hmm. consular crisis centre. Uh, we've got a total now on the task force of 166 staff, so we're endeavouring to make sure that we are doing everything we can mm. at maximum capacity. So I'll find out that okay. um, it, it may have been a particular time of day. There may be a reason for it, but mm. I would uh, I would hope people would not be left waiting uh, like that, Senator. So we'll, we'll look into that. I don't think that would be typical at all. Okay, I hope not. Uh, so what happens if someone doesn't answer the phone? Uh, they'll get called again. And uh, how many um, call... What if they aren't able to pick up the phone? The phone uh, number no longer is accurate. They don't we'll have send, a phone anymore. Then we'll send an email. Right. Is there at any point where you take them off the list because you've been unable to contact them? Uh, at, this, at this stage, the only way anybody gets taken off the list is because they say so to us. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've actually asked that specific question. Uh, mm -hmm. We will continue to try and contact people. Eventually, I mean, if, if we really can't find someone who's registered, then we're not going to be able to offer them a flight. Um, I understand but, that. But there is, uh, we're, we're being very careful about that, uh, mm -hmm. that we wouldn't take somebody off the list you know, in any peremptory way. Okay. Uh, I want to go very... Uh, quickly back to this issue about you're working with the airlines uh, because we heard at the last hearing and I think this is a statement well, I know it's a statement from the Department of Home Affairs they made the point airlines are commercial ventures the Australian government cannot control whose seats are sold to or at what price um, so can you please say a little bit more about uh, the work that you are doing with airlines to prioritise stranded Australians, and specifically, when did you start doing this work? Because it seems clear from the last hearing and from Senate estimates that there was a view, well, that's the airlines, we have nothing to do with it. There seems to be a different message coming through today, and if that is true, I welcome it, but I'm trying to understand. Are you working with airlines or are you not? Uh, well, Senator, I'll, spe I'll speak first for, for uh, DFAT. Other colleagues may wish, to, uh, may wish to add information. We work very closely with airlines mm -hmm. uh, and we do that, uh, we do that uh, a, number, a number of different ways. Uh, one is to access any available seats that we can. Uh, another is to set up the facilitated commercial flights. The third thing I would mention, it's not directly with the airlines, but it has the impact of working with the airlines, is our hardship fund. Uh, mm. And that hardship fund uh, has been uh, in existence for some months now. Um, and I should say in describing it, it's not that we did not provide consular loans previously, mm. we did, but this is actually a dedicated fund for the purposes of assisting people uh, impacted offshore by COVID. Uh, it does a number of things, Senator. Uh, it allows us to provide uh, subsistence loans to Australians waiting to come home. Uh, it allows us to provide loans to cover the cost of tickets. Mm. It also allows us to provide 
grants, that is non-repayable mm. elements of what is provided. And what we are able to do using a combination of those things is to fix the price that somebody will pay for a ticket if they are in genuine financial mm. need and qualify for the hardship fund so that the amount that they will repay is an economy class ticket on an yep. aircraft where the ticket prices may be inflated. Um, you'll note also, Senator, that the, uh, the costs of tickets on facilitated commercial flights you know, are you know, economy class ticket mm. prices for economy tickets as well. So that's a, that's a description of, of the various things that, uh, that we are doing, Senator, mm. but we recognise the difficulty people are facing. Um, some people, of course, are seeking business class seats to, to return because they're, if they're vulnerable, their vulnerability may mm. not be financial. They may have another kind of vulnerability and actually uh, want to purchase business class seats. So uh, the hardship fund relates to people who have genuine financial hardship. Mm. Okay. Um, um, Senator, Ms. Ms. Dacey can provide more detail sure, about the discussions yeah. with the airlines. Um, uh, thank you. So, sorry, Senator, just to be a, a couple of things before I talk more generally. We have always sought to work with the airlines through the whole course of the CAPS. Mm. So, um, my, my statement that we have no legal power to compel them is absolutely accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, even at the, when the CAPS were at their tightest, we would work with them uh, in a very... Um, targeted way when we had very specific cases to see whether we could work with the states to get an extra quarantine spot and then the airline to see if they mm. could carry a person. Mm. So that practice has always existed. It, it relies on the, the goodwill mm. of the airlines. Mm. Uh, and we have had, um, you know, throughout this process that in place. What has... Um, evolved through the CAPS and through the cabinet, the national cabinet process is that some premiers and the prime minister have um, come to this position of uh, ha having this surge capacity. And so what we would say to the airlines is we are not compelling you, but mm -hmm. there is a quarantine spot available if you can carry someone who is deemed vulnerable. Right. And so it is a, an, a, a effectively a negotiated agreement uh, the airlines are not compelled to do it because we are mm. unable to do so, but that is how it is working in practice. Mm. Uh, every witness who appeared at our last hearing has quite quickly after the hearing got a seat on a plane home. Is that just a coincidence? I have absolutely no idea. Anyone know? These are people who've been stranded for it's, months. There was also cap increases around that time, Senator. Yeah. These are people who've been stranded for months. I, Senator, it's a, it's a, it's a question for DFAT, Senator. I can't mm -hmm. speak about individual cases. Uh, often, uh, I think I can say in general terms, often uh, people who speak are uh, already known uh, to us. They mm -hmm. might be registered with us. They might uh, be what we would describe as a consular case. I'll be careful mm -hmm. here. I'm not speaking sure. about any particular individual. Uh, so it may be it may be that as a result of that uh, they've been able to get a ticket. Um, it's also possible that someone who had not come to our attention, who had not registered with us, mm -hmm. could come to our attention through that process. But again, I'll only speak in general terms. Sure. I won't talk about any specific okay. case. Uh, if I can go back to the thank you. If I can go back to the last hearing, I asked a question about whether or not the Commonwealth had done any gone to the market to test whether or not there was a, a, the capacity to hire a public health um, practitioners uh, to support a quarantine additional quarantine spaces. I asked in several ways, uh, and it was taken on notice. The answer I got back on notice did not really answer the question. It just said the Commonwealth has no contracts with providers to run quarantine facilities. I don't think the Department of Health was here at that point. Um, had the has the Department of Health done any uh, market testing to s consider whether or not there was an addition, there was the capacity to hire medical staff to uh, support additional quarantine spaces? Because the evidence we clearly got uh, from Prime Minister and Cabinet at the last hearing is that there simply wasn't. 
So the question of uh, have we done anything to run a quarantine facility that wouldn't be us and no, we haven't, because obviously it involves much more than medical staff. Mm. The issue about health providers, mm. we haven't tested the market, but we do have mm. contact with various providers and we have been talking to states and territories about ways they might be able to have additional uh, uh, staff in to assist with quarantine. So we've been providing referrals right. to... Yeah. But, OK, because but, it was, there was clearly the response given to me that we couldn't set one up because there's not enough medical staff to support it. Well, a quarantine involves clinical staff, it involves a whole stack of different staff and mm. security and so on. So a question yeah. about whether we would go to market about that is not a matter for health. But it is the case that there well, are various... Sorry, Ms Frame said it was a matter for health. Well, it's, so. a, it's a matter for health about medical personnel. Mm. And we have been working with some states to provide them referrals to places they might go for That wasn't the question. The question, that, the question I had asked... So it was about whether or not the Commonwealth was considering setting up a quarantine We facility. have not gone to market right. for that sort Thank of facility. You. Thank Senator, you. if I could just add, I believe that I, I specified that if the Commonwealth were to secure public health support for a quarantine uh, program, that would be taking from public health, the same public health workforce that are currently supporting state and territory quarantine programs, as well as other aspects of the yeah. COVID and response. And which is how we got into this, me then asking, well, how did you know that? And I asked if you'd tested the market or can look gone to actually ask that question. And I'm um, just trying to determine if anyone has actually Senator, ever asked that Senator, what I, I do know directly mm -hmm. is that states and territories are constantly reiterating to us that they have limited public health resources and they feel that mm -hmm. they are stretched at the moment. Mm -hmm. Professor Kelly, would you like to add? So, so just to add to that, Senator, we, mm -hmm. we've had a lot of experience in the Commonwealth throughout this pandemic in looking at ways we can surge, not mm -hmm. just for quarantine, but for example, the aged care response in Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, so we've used, uh, through throughout this year on, on many occasions, the OSMAT mechanism from the National mm. uh, Trauma Centre in, in Darwin. Uh, we've also had uh, uh, arrangements with Aspen and other, other private providers. Mm. But the point that uh, the Deputy Secretary Frame has made is, is, is a reality. We have a limited number of people in Australia that can perform these duties in a way that will protect the Australian public and provide that health and wellbeing services to the returnees. And we have to respect that. I'm not disputing that. I was trying to understand the factual basis for the evidence that was provided at the last hearing. Um, my question, uh, another question back to uh, Mr Sheehan. Uh, you talked about the hardship program and you made mention that it was split between uh, loans and grants. I think I asked this at the last hearing as well. If we could get a breakdown. You say there's $9 million been given out to 1,772 applicants. Can we get a breakdown in there as to between loans and grants, please? Look, the, I'm happy for answer, that to go unnoticed if that needs yeah, to. Yeah, that, that's Senator. We do have we do have that information. Mm -hmm. I think we can provide it to you. Mm -hmm. If I find it before we that's finish, fine. I'll give it to you. Otherwise, we'll take it on notice. Thank you. Um, this question is to the ABF. Um, I'm trying to understand how many Australian citizens and permanent residents have left Australia with ABF permission since the borders have closed and have not returned home. Are you able to give us that data? Um, not in its completeness. I could tell you how many people have um, left Australia um, and whether they've returned home. That's a, a harder um, question to answer. Um, right. But I can certainly get the number for you for how many have left. So the borders closed the 20th of March, is that correct? That is correct. So how many Australians have been given permission to leave? I have got it with me. Sure. Sorry. No. So um, since the 25th of March, um, when the uh, outbound uh, determination was made, 77,249 Australian citizens have departed Sorry, Australia. could you repeat that? I apologise. Uh, 77,249 Australian citizens departed mm -hmm. Australia by air. Right, so 77,000 have left. Yeah, um, and that's in a 98.9% reduction to pr the previous sure. year. I'm not disputing yep. that. Um, I'm trying to then 
So we've got 77,000 who have left. We can't match up the data as to how many of them have come back. No. And do we have any indication, do you actually ask when they leave, when they intend to come back? Uh, so there is one, um, yeah. one of the exemptions or, um, that we um, ask the question around mm. timing. Um, that is if they're applying um, since the 28th of September mm. to leave for a three month period. Um, and that is the only circumstance in which I understand we uh, ask the question about when they plan to return. Right. Okay. Um, I note that in your um, answer to a question on notice um, arising from the last hearing, um, you noted that uh, as of the 25th of September, there were 58 people who arrived on the business innovation and investment visa holders category. Uh, do you have any updated numbers for today on that I visa call, category? I might call upon my colleague, um, Deputy Secretary Kefford. I've got one Andrew Kefford, Deputy Secretary, Immigration and Settlement Services. I'm sorry, Senator, could you repeat the question? Was it about the business investment? Yeah, season? I'm just noting that as of the 25th of September, 58 people had arrived into Australia on the business investment, innovation and investment visa holders. It's my uh, recollection from the last hearing that that visa class was only approved for entry into Australia at the end of August. So correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, so that would essentially mean that between um, August, the end of August and in September, we'd had 58 people arrive, almost two a day. Um, so I'm trying to understand how many have arrived on that visa class uh, as of today. Thank you, Senator. You're right, it was at the end of uh, August. That is part of the, the government's uh, intention to continue to uh, bring in mm. skilled workers at the business investment temporary visas were uh, added the, the permanent ones had previously been included already. Um, since in, in the months of September and October, Senator, the 58 you've referred to, uh, mm -hmm. by the end of October, there was a total of uh, 304. 304. Jeez. That's right. 304 people have arrived on the business innovation and investment visa holder. In the months since, of, in the, months of the end of August. In the months of September and October, yes, Senator. So it's 304 spaces taken up in quarantine that can't be taken up by stranded Australians? There's been evidence about changes in the program, including with uh, New Zealand, Senator, but yes, travellers on those visas are required to quarantine. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> Is there any... Um, any plan whatsoever between now and Christmas to preserve spots for quarantine for stranded Australians over business investment and visa business innovation and investment visa holders? Senator, I won't add to the uh, add to the evidence that's been given uh, already today, noting the time, but would also observe that the exemption criteria is applied both in terms of maintaining the public health response, as Professor Kelly and others have remarked on, but also supporting the health response and supporting economic recovery, Senator. And so part of that is the, the funding that comes, the significant funding and investment in Australia that comes through this particular visa stream. All right, I'm gonna to have to wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Cufford. I'm not blaming you, I'm just gobsmacked by that number. Um, very quickly, um, I just would ask ABF to take on notice. Um, my understanding is the form does have an intended return date on it that people have to fill out. I've got a copy of it here. So could ABF please take that on notice? Um, because I think that, that may, you may want to correct your evidence there. Um, if I can just go to, um, in, as my last question, um, this morning the Prime Minister um, spoke about his commitment to get the 26,000 stranded Australians home before Christmas. Um, my recollection from earlier today is that um, we've had about 14,000 people from the DFAT list return home since he made that commitment. Is that correct? Uh, Senator, uh, in respect of how many people, I, I uh, was not in a position to hear exactly what was said this morning, but I can talk to how many people from the DFAT list 
uh, or registered with DFAT have returned since the 18th of September, you are correct, it is approximately 14,000. Because the Prime Minister told the media this morning uh, that uh, he seemed to suggest that he's in fact, in fact he said, in fact we have exceeded it in many respects with the number of people who've come back. He basically asserted that he's already got 35,000 people home, that he has gotten more than the 26,000 stranded Australians home. I just want to be clear, the DFAT list of stranded Australians has had 14,000 people come home. Y yes, Senator, but the Prime Minister is, is speaking about all the Australians coming home. And as I said before, there are people who are not on our list because they have tickets to come and that, home. But that is my point. And I think for the media who are watching, they need to understand this. When the Prime Minister blithely asserts that he's had 35,000 people come back and that he has exceeded his commitment to get the 26,000 stranded Australians home, that is not true. Only 14,000 from that stranded Australians list have come home since he made that commitment. I'd just say, Senator, that those Australians need to come home as well. Um, I'm not disputing that, but that was not his commitment on the 18th of September. Okay, I might inter just inter interrupt there and um, I just note the time. It's um, past our scheduled adjournment, so can I... Um, Thank witnesses uh, from right across the APS for appearing today for your time. We do appreciate your continued engagement with the committee during this inquiry and look forward to it continuing uh, into next year. Um, this, that concludes the, today's proceedings of the committee's inquiry into the Australian Government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Officials are reminded that answers to questions taken on notice are due in 10 working days. Um, again, thank you very much for your time today. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you.